Chapter 201, Heading Back Nick was surprised to see that the ecosystem of the island had developed into a perfect balance of large and small creatures as well as herbivores and carnivores. The Colorado Colorado served as the most abundant small prey item on the island while the Snuffus were clearly the most abundant large prey item. There was also just enough carnivorous species on the island to keep the rapidly increasing populations of these two creatures from getting out of hand. This didn't even consider the seafaring creatures that lived near the island due to the ley line node under it. That little detail certainly hadn't escaped Nick's notice when he arrived but just chose to ignore it since what self-respecting wizard wouldn't want a ley line node to themselves along with all the abundant mana that comes with it. The mana levels weren't at the same level as Hogwarts that was not only on a ley line nexus but had slowly been absorbing the excess magical energy of its students for the last thousand years but they were still far greater than in Diagon Alley. It was also this exact reason that these different species from all over the globe had adapted to the climate of the island without dying off. Thanks to the ample mana they were able to evolve faster than normal by using wild magic over time. Wild magic was unfortunately only available to magical creatures but wizards had learned how to imitate its effects via druidic spells at one point in time but the process was lost at some point. Nick knew this because he had at one point searched for the stuff in the Hogwarts library but apparently the practice was passed from master to apprentice and was never written down so after history did its thing all practitioners died off without successors taking all that knowledge with them. Nick had cursed the fools when he learned this since it was stupid to have an entire field of magic vanish because of tradition. Tradition was supposed to preserve history and knowledge yet in this case it doomed it. Shaking his head to clear away these distracting thoughts Nick looked at the manor and its surroundings as well as the path to the carriage. About 20 feet around the building and widening the path to the carriage about 10 feet on each side should do perfectly he decided before flying back down to in front of the manor. Ollivander was waiting rather impatiently for him when he finally touched down on the ground. As momentous an occasion as visiting the ancient home of Rowena Ravenclaw is, I want to begin my experiments with these feathers as soon as possible. The old man said honestly. Nick chuckled at this that won't be much of a problem since at the moment I lack the time to renovate the place at the moment. He said before calling Dottie, Saram and Helena over to him. The house elf appeared immediately while the other two took a couple of minutes to arrive since they had wandered off. The ho-ho also showed up but since it didn't have a name Nick couldn't exactly call it anyways so this worked. First he took out all the Lemba's bread he had in greed and handed it over to Saram. We will be leaving for a while so I will leave all this with you to keep you full as you seem to have the whole guardian of the island thing perfectly in hand. He said and the manticore merely chortled and took the nine and a half loaves from him. Looking at the bird Nick hesitated for a moment as depending on his next action things may get strange back in Diagon Alley, well stranger anyways. I don't know why you've stayed on this island this whole time but if you want to I can bring you with me to Hogwarts where there is a phoenix I'm sure you'll get along with great. Nick offered and the bird looked thoughtful for a moment before nodding and flying high into the air in such a way that the sun was behind it. Before Nick could express his confusion at this the bird literally shimmered away into a small ball of golden light that fell to the earth before vanishing revealing a small bird with puffy black and red feathers and three peacock-like crown feathers on its head and tail. So that's what the rebirth of a ho-ho looks like not as violent as the other two immortal birds at all rather it's almost gentle. Ollivander said fascinated while Nick picked up the small bird and comfortably settled it on his shoulder. After that Nick had Dottie apparate each of the leaving party back to the wand shop where Ollivander immediately locked himself away in the workshop much to Nick's amusement. Chapter 202, Important Purchase Nick and Helena went to the room with the ho-ho to basically spend the rest of the day relaxing. To be honest Nick was very much avoiding the book written to him by Kronos in fear of what he might find out. No matter how you look at it there was no reason such a being would do such a thing if it weren't a big deal. Sure the Titan may simply being genuinely trying to help Nick but there was simply not enough information to make such an assumption safely considering the myth of the Titan. Nick wasn't stupid enough not to notice how the Greek gods were the victors of that clash so it was entirely possible that they vilified the Titan falsely. The problem with this came in the form of the gods' own deeds that didn't exactly paint them in the most benevolent picture either. Zeus was a serial rapist, Athena was cruel and arrogant, Ares was behind a large amount of the drama in the world and Poseidon was cold and unfeeling just like his domain of the sea. The only decent god out of the lot was Hades who mostly just did his job when he wasn't being messed with by the other gods. Even the tale of how he fell into a one-sided love with Persephone was not his own doing despite the consequences it had. Unfortunately that was all Nick had to go on in this matter, myths. Needless to say he was more than justified in his caution in regards to that book. Still he wasn't idle as he had nearly 7000 points saved up at this point and he had a book that he had his eye on for quite a while now in the shop. 
specifically creating the Atronach Forge that was a detailed book on how to create a magical device that allows one to forge sentient magical constructs so long as the appropriate knowledge is used. This book was priced at 6,270 points in the shop due to the way that the system appraises value for books. Books were priced based of three factors from what Nick could see, commonness or how easily it could be acquired, usefulness or how useful the knowledge within the book is and power or if the book held innate power or use beyond that of a container for knowledge. This book was from an entirely different world which made the price already considerably higher than most books from this world. The knowledge in the book was also very useful since it was a guide to the creation of a versatile magical device which raised the price even higher. Thankfully the book held no power of its own so that actually lowered the price. After all of that the system determined a price based on its own grading system. A rather funny thing Nick found was that while most of the books from this world were more expensive value-wise in the system than in stores though there was exceptions to this rule. Things such as Lockhart's works about his adventures in the magical world. In stores each of the man's seven books cost five galleons which in terms of system points should mean that they would cost hundreds of points normally. The truth however was that due to the books being actually detrimental to learn from and extremely common were actually cheaper than nearly any other book save for nursery rhymes at a mere three points a book. Nick couldn't help but laugh at this as even the system thought the man was full of shit. Anyway Nick purchased the book he was interested in and, and immediately took it out of greed where it had appeared. Helena looked at the old brown leather bound book with frayed pages curiosity. When Nick opened the book however she was left stupefied as the language was unlike anything she had ever seen before. The clearly handwritten characters were strangely sharp looking and clearly based in some sort of symbolism. Nick on the other hand instinctively knew what the language was and was surprised to learn that it was basically that world's version of demonic script, Dedrick runes. No wonder it was so expensive, I could probably use this book to make a primer for a considerably large amount of the Dedrick rune system. That would make two whole magical writing languages that I alone will know in this world he thought pleasantly surprised. What language is that? Helena asked curiously. I am not actually sure of its origins but it looked interesting so I grabbed it from a clearly forgotten spot. Nick said not technically lying since he honestly had no clue where the language actually originated from and the book was definitely from an abandoned place considering its poor state. Chapter 203, Atronax Helena looked disappointed at this but shrugged it off since this wasn't the first time she had come across an unknown language in a book before. What's it about? She asked since she couldn't read it herself. I haven't read it myself but from what I can see on the first page it appears to be the research notes of his wizard. Nick said honestly. Ugh, why is it always research notes and unfun topics with you? She complained before going on to ignore him and spoil Steve like usual. Nick chuckled at what she said but didn't argue as he did indeed usually only read things that would advance his knowledge and this book was no different. He of course wasn't going to point out that this book would let him literally create an army of loyal magical creatures whose origins were from an entirely different world. Atronachs were basically pure elemental energy given spirits and made manifest via magical energy. This allowed them to be summoned or shaped into any number of shapes based on the summoner's power and skill. In Nick's case he would likely stick to common animal forms such as bears or lions. The rest of the day was spent with Nick carefully memorizing the information within this book that gave him several interesting pieces of information. For example he learned that unlike most Atronachs those made by the Atronach Forge were in fact actually created by it. To clarify most summoned Atronachs were those that were naturally born in some plane of oblivion or another. Somehow the process to birth an Atronach had been figured out by whoever wrote this book which was remarkable. Nick was quite happy to find that this process was recorded in the book as well via the enchantment runes needed to create the Atronach Forge. It was a fairly simple process that involved a medium such as a ruby or sapphire being imbued with highly dense elemental energy of the corresponding element. Fire for ruby and lightning for sapphire in those particular examples. After that it was a matter of filling the gems with neutral spiritual energy until the gems burst apart. At that point if done correctly a vortex of magical energy will form before revealing the new Atronach. There was a warning at this point that in order to bind the Atronach to its maker one needs to soak the gems in their blood before doing this process or else the Atronach will be wild. Nick grimaced when he saw the schematics for the forge at the end of the book alongside a list of ingredients as the ingredients were extremely expensive in the shop when Nick checked. By far the most expensive things were ebony in a fairly large amount and an unaligned sigil stone. Those two things alone would cost Nick nearly 500,000 points to purchase from the shop's material section. It's a good thing that I am pretty sure I can just make a ring array with the same function for cheaper he thought relieved. Time passed quickly after that and two weeks came and went as June ended and July began. 
During this period Nick hadn't been taught anything really new by Ollivander besides the woodworking techniques to shape the wood. It was honestly just the same stuff as muggle woodworking and thus merely needed practice to get down more than anything else. By the end of this month though Nick could pick out almost any wood and successfully tap and shape it into decent enough wand housings. He still made mistakes on the woods needing a more experienced touch such as burl woods but he was at an acceptable level in Ollivander's opinion. It was at the 1st of July that this peaceful time was broken as a tall middle-aged man with long thin black hair and neatly trimmed goatee walked into the shop in a dark-colored muggle suit with the front open. Welcome to Ollivander's. Fine wand makers since 382 BC. How might I help you today sir? Nick heard Ollivander say from the front of the shop as he worked on carefully shaping the elm wood in his hands in the workshop. I am looking for Nicholas Ravenclaw, is he in by chance? The man said with a polite smile. Nick stopped what he was doing and listened in at this point since it concerned him directly. Might I inquire as to who is asking about him? Ollivander said seeming to not recognize the man in front of him. The man chuckled serious black. He said not bothered by not being recognized. A decade-long stint in Azkaban had left its marks on him permanently so very few people recognized him at the moment. Chapter 204, Sirius Black Ollivander scrutinized Sirius for a moment with a stern expression before sighing Time has not been kind to you it seems, you look like a totally different person than the Sirius Black in my memory. A bright handsome young man left like this, you have my pity. He said honestly. Sirius shook his head with a look of acceptance I have accepted that I cannot turn back the hands of Time, no need for pity. Now about your apprentice. Sirius said with a smile. Ollivander was about to turn around to go get Nick but stopped when Nick stepped out of the back of the shop. He was still covered in wood dust and had the now chicken-sized ho-ho that he had named Dusk sitting on his right shoulder. No need to get me, I heard the entire conversation. Nick said calmly. Looking at Sirius he noticed that the man while certainly not young looking still had a noble handsomeness to him as well as a decent amount of muscle under the suit that hid it well. It seems that your stay in St. Mungo's was quite useful for your recovery, you are not as scrawny as I assumed. Nick said honestly. Sirius chuckled the Medi witches took good care of me even if they were a bit strict for my tastes. He said cheerfully. Nick nodded before looking at Ollivander do you mind if I finish up later if I bring back dinner? He asked and the old man smiled and nodded take your time and do remember nothing bitter. He said and Nick chuckled before walking out to the store with Sirius following behind him. Once out of the shop Nick turned to Sirius shall we talk over dinner? I know of a perfect place that is nice and private with exquisite food. Nick said with a grin in his best Dumbledore impression knowing Sirius would get it. Judging from the laughter of the man Nick was sure that he had assumed correctly. Ha, huh, been quite a while since I had a good laugh like that, thank you. Sirius said sincerely grateful. Nick shrugged I try my best, though the offer was completely true. He said with a wide grin. Sirius beamed I'm sure we'll get along famously you and I lead the way. He said happily and Nick headed towards Crumontas. Sirius was quite surprised when he saw the restaurant a few minutes later in a clearly seldom visited corner of Diagon Alley. You weren't joking when you said it was private, I didn't even know it existed until now. He said casually. Nick chuckled I found it by accident myself but it is easily my favorite place to dine these days. He said honestly. Nick then led the way into the store which set off the bell he was quite familiar with these days. Soon the old man walked out of the back and smiled when he saw Nick on Mr. Ravenclaw and you brought a guest. What a treat. The old man said seeming genuinely happy to see Nick and Sirius. Nick greeted the old man with a smile before taking a seat at his usual table where Sirius sat across from him. The old man brought a couple of menus to the two of them before waiting patiently for them to choose a beverage. I'll have a spiced lemonade. Nick said after reading the options. I'll take a butter beer, thanks. Sirius said with a smile. The old man shared a look with Nick who could only shrug back. Out of all the interesting options Sirius chose a butterbeer which clearly made the old man think Nick's guest lacked the gourmet inclination that Nick had. It's not that I don't want to try anything else, just that the potions I'm on won't let me. Sirius explained and the old man nodded in understanding before heading into the back of the shop to get the drinks. I assume you've gone to see Harry already. Nick asked gaining Sirius's attention again. The man shakes his head with a guilty look on his face. How could I dare to show my face around Harry until that rat bastard gets kissed by a Dementor? He said with clear regret on his face. Looks like you have about two days left then, the man is set to receive his kiss on Friday night. Nick said and Sirius nodded. He definitely deserves it after what he did. 
but enough about that I came to thank you for setting me free and clearing my name. Sirius said controlling his emotions. Nick waved it off I didn't do it for you, but Harry. Though I admit that there is something I want in your possession. He said thinking of a certain locket hidden away by the demented house elf. Chapter 205, Death of Peter Pettigrew. Name it and I'll have it handed over straight away, it's the least I can do. Sirius said without any hesitation and Nick knew that the man truly meant it. My sources tell me that your house elf has a cursed locket in its possession while your cousin Bellatrix has a goblet in her vault with the same curse. I want them so that I may cleanse them of that foul curse. Nick said honestly and bluntly. Doing so will prevent Dumbledore from freaking out too much when he finds out about it via Sirius's own testimony. The best part was that he could even present the items to the old man as proof that he did indeed cleanse them. I'll get the diary at the start of the year which will mean I have cleaned four of the current five horcruxes once I get the ring. All that would be left after that would be Harry which will take some extra work on my part. Nick thought seriously. Sirius frowned in confusion when he heard this though I will ask about the locket once I get home but the goblet will take a while is that okay? He asked worried that waiting would making Nick unhappy. Nick shook his head and smiled so long as I get to cleanse them I do not mind waiting a while, in fact you are more than welcome to have them back once I am done. Nick said sincerely. Sirius was surprised to hear this so it's only the curse on these items you are after? It must be a terrible curse then, why don't I have Dumbledore remove the curse instead? Sirius offered but Nick shook his head. This curse is very special and so can't be removed without destroying the item it was on normally but I have a way to do so that is unique to me. He said honestly. Sirius nodded in understanding some sort of family magic I take it. He asked for confirmation and Nick nodded something like that yet. He said honestly. All right give a couple of days and I should be able to get the locket to you but as for the goblet it may take some time. Sirius said happy to be able to pay Nick back even if only a little for his help. After that they simply made casual conversation over their respective meals. Friday came around and Nick was invited to witness Peter receiving the Dementor's kiss alongside the entire Weasley family, Harry, Sirius, and of course Dumbledore. He arrived at the ministry in order to wait for either an escort or the other invitees. The only person to arrive early as well as Sirius who wanted nothing more than for the execution to get done and over with. Nick was slightly curious if fate would shift to have Peter escape somehow or if the rat will truly die today. All the previous changes to canon could be considered fairly minor all things considered but Peter's role in Voldemort's resurrection was by no means trivial. In fact it could be argued that the man played the role of linchpin for that whole series of events that was vital to its success. Sirius also handed over the locket held within a special box enchanted to seal its influence while they waited. An hour later and Arthur Weasley, his wife, and Harry all arrived at the ministry followed shortly by Dumbledore himself. After having their wands temporarily taken as a cautionary measure by the Aurors the group was portkeyed to Azkaban's execution grounds. A large floating creature with black tattered robes covering it floated in the center of the area releasing a chill and feeling of despair by its mere presence. Nick studied the creature and it in turn seemed to study him before both chose to ignore the other. Whatever connection to death Dementors had wasn't as strong as that of Thestral's and so the creature merely found Nick slightly attention grabbing rather than connected to him in some way. Nick himself had a similar feeling and thus waited patiently for Peter to arrive with the Aurors like everyone else here today. It didn't take long at all as Fudge arrived with a journalist from the Daily Prophet and a team of Auror protecting him before making this big show of greeting everyone. Soon after a haggard-looking Peter Pettigrew was dragged out onto the execution field kicking and screaming in fear as he begged for his life with tears and snot all over his face. Fudge gave the command and the Dementor eagerly pounced at Peter and with a sickening sucking sound Nick watched as the man's soul was forcefully removed from his body and devoured by the rotten toothed circular mouth of the Dementor and Peter Pettigrew's body fell limp, he was dead. Chapter 206, Wand Splitting Nick was honestly surprised to see that the execution had been completed flawlessly. I suppose I have truly entered into unknown territory at this point. The future is no longer set in the same course as before and I need to be vigilant to any unknown outcomes now he thought seriously as the group left the execution ground each with their own different thoughts. Harry was horrified at the way Dementors killed while Dumbledore was sad at the loss of life in general. Sirius though had conflicted emotions as on one hand he was relieved to know Peter was finally dead while on the other hand he was lost on what to do now. For almost a decade now he had wallowed in self-pity and grief for the loss of his friend and the betrayal of someone he trusted. When he was suddenly told that he was being released since they had caught Peter he was astonished at the turn of events and happy that justice was to be done. But now that Peter is dead he didn't feel any satisfaction from it at all only emptiness as he lacked a purpose to drive him forward. 
Nick meanwhile had Dottie apparate him to the middle of nowhere in order to cleanse the locket of the soul shard in it. Removing the sealing box and the Nazgul ring from greed he opened the box and immediately dropped the ring onto the locket. The soul soul shard barely had time to react before the ring latched onto its housing and began to convert it to pure spiritual energy with Nick's signature. Dottie watched on from nearby with a horrified expression as a dreadful scream came from the locket as it glowed gold and white before the ring released the now inanimate locket after storing away the energy for Nick. It did not fail to dawn on Nick that the ring was growing more powerful with each soul shard he fed it and was also growing smarter as well. Perhaps if it is fed enough it may turn into a full-blown creature. Nick thought now feeling slightly reluctant to destroy the ring once its purpose was through. It was obvious loyal to him if its apparent eagerness to please him was any indication so he decided to wait and see if it eventually becomes a problem or a boon. Monday was an interesting day for Nick as was in the workshop with Olive Under hold one of the many housing he had made. Today I will show you how to carve the runes needed to turn this ordinary piece of wood into a true wand. The first step is of course the splitting charm used to open the wand up. In this case Apert of Ivora. He said while pointing his own hornbeam wand at the wooden housing. A blue spell shot out and into the housing which caused a crack to appear down the center of the wand housing exposing its core area. This spell was designed to be as easy to undo as possible without interfering with the runes written within it. Can you tell me why it is needed instead of transfiguration? Olivander quizzed Nick suddenly. When a transfiguration is undone it removes any changes in the object that was transfigured. In this case I imagine that that would also remove the runes added as well. Nick answered easily enough since he excelled at transfiguration. Olivander nodded with a an approving look quite so, wand makers in the early times tended to just use wand housing split by muggle means. But the problem with that method was that if the enchantment holding the wand together was undone the wand itself was as well. Olivander said with a derisive scoff. Instead of dealing with that sort of nonsense many wand makers put in a lot of effort to create this method of splitting that although temporary allowed the runes to be placed without compromising the integrity of the wand. He continued with a proud expression as he spoke of the progress of wand making. Nick nodded in understanding since while a wand that could be dismantled easily like that previous model could be overcome with skill he doubted many were capable of it. Finite. Olivander said and the crack in the wooden house closed up as if it was never there to begin with. He then went on to show Nick the wand movements and tell him the intent needed to cast the spell successfully. Once Nick showed an adequate understanding of the spell he had him practice on the wand housings he had made previously. Nick had no problem admitting he had a slight problem with controlling the power of his spells which resulted in more than a few wand housings bursting into splinters. Chapter 207, Redecorating It took Nick quite a few tries but he eventually managed to cast the spell well enough to split a wand housing without destroying it. Anyone who claimed that having more power made it easier to learn simple spells lied through their fucking teeth. Nick cursed mentally after failing to get the desired outcome for the umpteenth time in the last four days. The truth of the matter as far as he could tell was that it wasn't more power that made it easier but experience in spell casting that he simply lacked. If anything him being so powerful turned out to be detrimental in this case as he had to actively hold back from the urge to cast a spell at full tilt like he was used to. Some spells excelled in such situations but others that required pinpoint precision simply failed in those cases. Still this is good training for magical control that may become useful at some point later he thought finally splitting a housing correctly. He went to eat dinner at Crumontas as he had been accustomed to before going to bed since he planned to go shopping for furnishings for the Ravenclaw Manor the next day. Waking up at dawn as he was used to Nick got dressed for the day before having Dottie follow him out of the wand shop after he said good morning to Olivander. House elves super convenient for furniture shopping as all it took for Nick to have the stuff he bought sent to the island was a quick snap of the fingers on Dottie's part. By the end of the day he had bought enough, mattresses, rugs, toilets and other miscellaneous decorative or must-have items to fully redecorate the entire Ravenclaw Manor. They were all stored in the greenhouse at the moment but he planned on making a trip to the island himself the next day to arrange everything. Early the next morning Nick went to the island with only Helena this time which allowed him to cast magic without worry. He used this opportunity to cut back the plant life like he had previously wanted to. He left the trees that were fully grown alone when he did this but the rest was cleared back considerably from the manor. Nick also used magic to take off the vines and dirt that had covered the manor over the last thousand years restoring its regal look. After that he simply went through the whole building and thoroughly decorated it so that it no longer resembled a cold empty place but a warm welcoming one. The toilets were also of a special magical variety that banished the waste after they were flushed. Nick as a fairly modern individual simply refused to use primitive implements like a chamber pot to do his business. The only part of the building that didn't get much changes was the bathing room as it was basically perfect as is. 
All the old furniture from over a thousand years ago was stored in one of the empty rooms in case Nick ever wished to use them or sell them as the antiques they are. It's strange seeing the place so vibrant and cozy. Helena admitted when he was done. Nick shook his head just because this place never felt like a home doesn't mean it never should, all ice melts eventually after all. He said with a grin. So it does. She agreed seeing the changes he made. Now I just need to graduate from Hogwarts so that I can set up a permanent workshop here. Nick said with a sigh. Unless you can somehow get to graduate a few years early you still have six years I'm afraid. Helena said with a giggle. Ugh, I know, but it's so bloody boring to sit in class for so long with topics I've already learned. He complained dramatically. She chuckled you'll survive. She said with a roll of her eyes. With his work at the island done with Nick went back to the shop to continue practicing his splitting. He had gotten fairly competent with the spell thanks to his diligence in training to control his power. An interesting thing to note was that the reason Ollivander hadn't said anything about him casting magic despite the trace to detect it was because he had informed the Ministry already that Nick would be doing so. Nick only learned this because he brought it up when the old man asked him to practice. Apparently the whole trace rule for minors actually had stipulations in place in regards to either non-threats to the statute like pure bloods or those in an apprenticeship such as Nick. It wasn't super useful information to have but Nick still liked knowing it. Chapter 208, First Wand on Monday Ollivander tested Nick's skill level and finding it acceptable decided to move on to the second to last step of wand crafting, rune carving. The runes most commonly used in wand creation have been chosen based on three factors, power, efficacy, and efficiency. To be more specific how strong they make the wand, how well they worked regardless of magic channeled into them and how little smoothly they allow magic to go from wizard to spell. Ollivander explained before writing out a set of runes on a piece of paper that consisted of four words. In a sentence these words would make no sense but as part of an enchantment they worked just fine. They were focus, spirit, small and pull, specifically if they were translated to English which Nick knew since he could read them easily. Now the key to carving runes is consistency and precision, watch. Ollivander said and split a housing before taking an engraving pen and carefully carving these words perfectly. As you can see I carved the runes at the exact same depth and width apart. Right now I could put a wand core in this housing and close it up to make a weak but functional wand, like so. Ollivander said. He then took a unicorn hair from the jar of them on the workbench and placed it carefully in the center of the wand before cancelling the splitting charm causing the housing to close. Nothing happened but then Ollivander picked up the wand and flicked it at a wood chip. Sparks came from the tip of the wand and Ollivander nodded. Oak, 10 inches, rigid and prefers charms. All in all a usable wand. He said before handing the wand to Nick to examine. Looking it over Nick couldn't help but be surprised at how simply it looked and yet he could tell that it was anything but. I will say that most wands actually have more runes than that on them based on the wander maker's skill and research into the subject. My wands for example have no less than 7 runes on them at any time with my more complex works going up to even 34 runes. Ollivander said proudly. That sounds like a lot to be written down on such a small surface. Nick said honestly as he tried to image such a thing. Ollivander nodded if the writing was of the same size you would be correct but should a rune scribing technique called minimizing be used it is actually not much. He said honestly. This has nothing to do with you however as your task for now is to put the four runes on a housing correctly. Once you are able to do that adequately I shall take you to the ministry to get your veritology license which will let you sell any wands you make. The old man said with a smile. Nick quickly discovered that carving the runes on wood instead of metal was pretty much the same thing only slightly more prone to failure due to the softness of the material. As a result he already had a fairly good grasp of the carving process needing only two more days before he successfully made a wand using some of Steve's shed fur as the core. It was an elm wand at nine and a half inches, whippy and with a preference for transfiguration. Ollivander himself harshly looked it over but after finding no real flaws in craftsmanship declared it a fine first wand and let Nick keep it as the first wand made always held sentimental value. The next week started out on a slightly sour but not unusual note as another town had been sacrificed. The rest of the week though was dedicated to Nick honing his rune carving to be able to consistently create new wands. By Friday Ollivander had decided that it was time to get him licensed and just in time too as according to Ollivander the first years will start to show up at the start of the new month that was just around the corner. His final real lesson in veridology was apparently how to match a wizard to a wand. Nick could only chuckle at how the old man was planning to use the first years wand matching as a teaching opportunity. 
still the ministry's test to get a license for legal veritological work was actually pretty strict as Nick needed to craft a wand from scratch with the ministry's provided materials. All while being scrutinized and graded by a team of three experts from the Department of Magical Creation. He took his time and made sure to do his work in a neat and orderly fashion allowing him to finish the unicorn hair elder wood wand with no problems. Chapter 209, I'm a Professional an interesting thing about the Veritological license was that it was split between different levels based on skill with the rating one got for each level displayed. The levels were called stars and were represented on the license as such with 10 stars being the highest. Ollivander was one of the few people to have the honor of being a 10-star wand maker. Each star was further separated based on the grading system that Hogwarts used but the failing grades were only included past the first star. These grades from lowest to highest were T, Troll, D, Dreadful, P, Poor, a, acceptable, E, exceeds expectations, and O, outstanding, dot. Ollivander was a 10-star O-ranked veritologist and at the end of the test Nick received a metal badge with two stars on it and a large O in the first star and an A in the second. It means your skill was enough to place you a single rank above novice. Ollivander explained when Nick asked about it. This surprised Nick as he had assumed that this was the bare minimum skill to qualify for a license but apparently not. Ollivander chuckled when he saw Nick's astonishment to be honest I actually held you back from taking the test until you reached this point to preserve my own reputation. After all I am the world premier wand crafter so any student of mine even one for a few months needs to be extraordinary. He said honestly. Nick could understand this as it made plenty of sense if you thought about it. Ollivander had rarely ever taught another person and was the single most renowned wand maker in the world so if his students weren't at a certain level when they were tested it would state that he was not nearly as skilled as a teacher lessening his reputation. It was stupid but that was just the way reputation works in the wizarding world unfortunately. Still don't go thinking that this is enough for me to accept you have reached a decent level of skill. You will reach at least the three star A standard before you leave my tutelage. Ollivander said sternly and Nick could only shrug in acceptance. The old man wasn't joking either as he cracked down on every little flaw in the wands Nick made the entire last week of July even when the school shopping list came in. Nick had already expected it but seeing that the majority of the list consisted of Lockhart's works irritated him to no end. Rather than spend 35 galleons on the books he simply purchased six sets of the books from the system and sent five of them to the Weasleys who definitely couldn't afford that outrageous price. For a poor family like them 175 galleons was enough to almost bankrupt them. Besides Nick wanted to make amends with them for lying to them when he had visited. While he was sure that they could understand why he did it it didn't change the fact that he had deceived them to get what he was after which definitely hurt a bit. Harry was far more complicated to deal with as he didn't care about wealth or anything like that but he very much had cared that Nick had kept something like that from him. Still Ollivander much like usual was right in that the first week of August had first years coming in droves. You see when a wand is held by a wizard or witch who they don't acknowledge there is various ways it can make this known. For example in your case the wands either went lifeless and non-responsive in your hand or turned violent from the rejection. Of course we were able to avoid the later occurrence most of the time due to your sensitivity to the wands. Ollivander explained as Nick measured a first year who looked very weird out to get dealt with by a student only a year older than them. The first year's mother clearly shared this concern but Nick merely smiled and showed them his license no need to worry, I'm a professional. He said confidently. This show of authenticity let them relax considerably and Nick could only glare at Helena who was snickering to herself in the corner while pampering Steve who Nick could swear had gained weight. At least Dusk had Nick's back or in this case shoulder in his full large rooster-sized glory. Nick almost wanted to burn his license by the end of the week though as he long since lost track of how many times he had said that line while showing his credentials. Things got awkward on Saturday however when the Weasleys entered the shop to get Ginny Weasley the only daughter of the family her wand. Chapter 210 Surprise matching. Ah, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley how very nice to see you both. You must be here to get your daughter's first wand. Ollivander greeted the adults in a friendly manner. Good afternoon everyone, I hope it's not a problem but I have been left in charge of the matching process as part of my apprenticeship. Please bear with me if I take longer than expected. Nick said in a polite business tone. The younger members of the family looked very conflicted as if unsure if Nick might match Ginny wrongly on purpose to get back at them for giving him the cold shoulder even though he technically helped them. Nick picked up on this and pulled out his license for the umpteenth time I am a professional so none of you need to worry about me bringing personal matters into my work. Should I make such an error I can assure you that Mr. Ollivander would remove me from this shop immediately. He said reassuringly. The entire family looked at Ollivander and the old man nodded his head with a reassuring smile that let them relax. 
Nick didn't lie either as he did his job in the exact manner he was supposed to without any strange actions at all. Ginny herself however was horribly embarrassed since part of this process was measuring the body of the witch or wizard getting the wand before making calculation on how they would grow. The reason for this was so that a person with very short limbs as an adult didn't end up with a wand that was uncomfortably large in their hands or a tall person with a small wand, no pun intended. This meant that things like wingspan, neck length, height and posture needed to be thoroughly measured and added to the calculations. After that was the fun part where Nick had to begin going through various types of cores and woods in a certain set of lengths to find the correct match. What Nick hadn't known however was that Ollivander had played a small trick in which he had switched out the wand made by him from its box with a wand of the same material that Nick had made with one of Dusk's shed feathers. It was a U wand of 11 and a quarter inches that was swishy and preferred charm work. Nick didn't have time to react when Ginny opened the box and gave the wand a swish like she had been and it let off red sparks showing its acknowledgement. Nick went pale at the scene and the family saw this and looked worried until Ollivander spoke up. Oh? Now isn't this an interesting outcome? He said with a look of pure amusement. What do you mean? Molly Weasley asked in hopes of understanding what was going on. You see that particular wand was created by none other than my apprentice here using the feather of the ho-ho on his shoulder. Ollivander said honestly. The entire family and Harry who was with them all froze dumbfounded at this information. You made that? Ron asked in disbelief and Nick reluctantly nodded. To be honest I was under the impression it had been dismantled already instead of placed with the rest of the wands for sale. He said while giving Ollivander a suspicious look. I found it a worthy addition to the wares. The old man said unbothered. You heard the expert on the matter, it should serve you well. Take it as a gift as I'll cover the cost out of pocket since it is my first wand that has ever been matched. Nick said to Ginny with a smile. The Weasley family left after that and Nick turned to give Ollivander a mean look as it was clear that he did this on purpose. No need to be upset, my uncle who ran this hop previously did the same to me when I was younger. The old man said with a nostalgic look. Nick could only sigh helplessly and drop the matter while secretly deciding to check each wand before he offers it from now on. The cost of the wand was practically nothing at all as the only part of it sourced by Ollivander was the wood which was not very expensive. If someone else were to buy though it would either be the standard seven galleons for first years as mandated by the ministry or nearly twenty due to the material prices. A ho-ho feather is very very hard to acquire and the only reason the price was that low was it was a shed feather used in the core rather than one that had been plucked from dusk before that point. One of those would be in the range of nearly fifty galleons instead, assuming dusk would allow a feather to be plucked forcefully that is. Chapter 211, Luna Lovegood the next customer for the shop was equally strange though in a very different way than the Weasleys. Through the door walked a thin tall man with shoulder-length white thin hair and slightly crossed brown eyes. He wore a long set of baggy robes and a necklace like a triangular eye around his neck. Behind him walked a 11-year-old girl with waist-long dirty blonde hair and very pale eyebrows. The thing that caught Nick's attention the most however was her eyes that were silvery grey and filled with a sense of curiosity and intelligence. This was of course Xenophilius Lovegood and his daughter Luna Lovegood having come to shop for Luna's school supplies. Both Lovegood seemed surprised to see Nick manning the shop with Ollivander merely watching on from a chair behind the counter. The two of them were far from narrow-minded however and adapted instantly. Good afternoon sir, we are here to have my Luna matched with her first wand if it's no trouble. Xenophilius said with a friendly smile. Not at all if it sets you at ease. Nick started to speak but Luna interrupted him you hate saying that. She said catching Nick off guard. He was well aware that Luna was far more attuned to magic than most wizards from the books that all but lay it out but that didn't mean he wasn't ill prepared to be confronted with it. He didn't say anything but actively concealed the entirety of his magical energy within his body and watched closely as her face visibly changed in surprise and confusion. And here I thought I was selling the act perfectly. Nick said with a grin yet Luna merely furrowed her brows while looking as if she was trying to find something missing. You rely on that ability far too much I'm afraid it's better to learn to read body language instead. Much more reliable. He added trying to be helpful. Xenophilius as well as Ollivander looked confused at this interaction. What ability are you talking about? Luna's father asked curiously since clearly Nick had noticed something about his daughter that he had not. What do you know about accidental magic? Nick asked calmly. Despite not having anything to do with wand matching this was far too interesting for Ollivander to bring the subject back to wands. It happens usually as a result of high emotions and no normal outlet for release like wands. Zeno, I'm shortening it, answered confidently. Nick nodded that is mostly correct, 
but did you know that wizards and witches are constantly releasing magical energy from our bodies? Nick asked and the man nodded. That magical energy is filled with whatever emotion one is feeling at the time. Luna here seems to possess the innate ability to visibly see and interpret these energies and as a result the rough thoughts of the person who she is looking at. It is not infallible however as I have just shown her though, hence the suggestion to learn body language. Nick explained. Zeno looked at his daughter for confirmation and she also seemed convinced at this explanation. It should be true since all of his nargles disappeared and now it's like he isn't even there, it is rather bothersome. Luna said making her displeasure at Nick's act of withholding his intentions from her bluntly known. Nick chuckled at this while both Olivander and Zeno were astounded to learn of Luna's gift. Can you also see these energies? Is that why you knew how to prevent her from reading yours? Can you teach others how to do it as well? Zeno eagerly pelted Nick with questions that even Olivander seemed highly interested in learning the answer to. Respectively no, no, and also no. I will answer any concerns you may have for your daughter's ability but my own will remain private. Nick said sternly. Seeing that there was no more questions Nick moved the topic back to getting Luna matched to a wand like they were originally there for. Nick of course measured Luna who seemed very uncomfortable not being able to see what Nick was feeling and by extension thinking as he worked. Keeping in mind her personality Nick immediately went to the ash wands in the store which caused Olivander to raise an eyebrow in interest. Luna reached out and before she could touch any of the wands that rejected her Nick snatched them away. Luna clearly was startled by this but being as clever as she was started to target those wands in particular to test him. Nick was amused at this and played along after seeing how she was trying to figure out if he had lied about being able to see magical energy. Unfortunately for her he had not lied about not being able to see it as his was superior to a watered down magical sense like hers as he could even feel internal magical energy as well as far more than just the emotions held within. Chapter 212, Summer's End Luna was quite clever however and quickly seemed to realize this as she purposefully went to grab a wand that was on the counter behind her after sneakily moving to stand in front of it only to be stopped. Her ability only worked if she had an unobstructed view of the magical energy and if someone stood in front of the source of the energy she was after they covered it up stopping her and this rule clearly did not apply to Nick. While she may seem ditzy and crazy most of the time her mind was incredibly sharp. Both Olivander and Zeno watched this interaction quietly as it was fairly clear to them what was going on. Eventually though Nick tricked Luna into grabbing the wand that had been trying to get her attention this entire time finishing the match much to the girl's clear irritation. If it had to be described what sort of face she made then it was like a child that had a fascinating toy taken from them. You can settle the bill with Mr. Olivander and get on your way to the rest of your shopping. Nick said with a chuckle. I'll win next time. Luna swore with a determined expression. You are free to try as I am not a very hard to find person normally. Nick said alluding to the fact he is normally in his workshop when not in class. Luna then proceeded to angrily drag her father out of the shop after paying for the wand. Full of secrets aren't you? Olivander says with a wide smile. Nick shrugged but didn't say anything since he simply didn't need to. At this point even a blind man could see that Nick was very much a different sort of wizard. Still despite how antagonistic that whole interaction was it was fairly clear to Nick that he enjoyed teasing the blonde. Her reactions are simply too good not to he thought with a smirk. Luna had obviously never learned how to control her own emotions very well as she was practically an open book once you ignored any strange words or actions she may say or do. Unfortunately Nick missed the perfect opportunity to snatch the diary away due to working during the Weasley's confrontation with the Malfoys. It was a little strange how Lucius Malfoy was still willing to go through with his plan after the whole event with Nick freeing Sirius while simultaneously taking Peter out of the picture. It was possible that he simply never thought that his plan would ever be connected to him since his role in the whole thing was basically ditching the diary and hoping for the best. Unfortunately he failed to take into consideration just how badly his house elf hated him. It was shown pretty clearly in the books that despite the loyalty that house elves are forced to show their masters they very much can indirectly attack those same masters. Dobby repeated did this in the second book and Sirius's house elf Kriaker basically manipulated the fact that Bellatrix was part of the black household to feed her information just to spite Sirius. Moral of the story is that if they want to house elves can and will ruin any plan you have so treat them well so they don't want to. Nick lived by this idea when it came to Dottie who got good food and was never punished for anything not his fault. Hell Nick even went so far as to pay Dottie ten galleons every two weeks to be used however he wished. Admittedly this took a lot of convincing and no small amount of assurances that the house elf could put the money back into the household if he wished, which is basically every single time he was paid. 
using said money Dottie had restocked the pantry at Ravenclaw Manor and was slowly adding small magical decorations all over the place that frankly livened the place up greatly. Nick didn't know how but the house elf had even somehow gotten his hands on an ore and magical timber supplier and was slowly filling one of the empty rooms with both though in tiny quantities. Things slowed down business-wise in the second week of the month so Nick was back to practicing his wand crafting from scratch under Ollivander's stern watch. Another town being sacrificed came and went with any real fuss and Nick was improving by leaps and bounds in the art of wand crafting now that he had gotten out of the rough novice stage of it. The only gripe he had was that he wasn't allowed to experiment with the runes he carved into the core of the wand to try and improve the power of his creations as summer break slowly drew to a close. Chapter 213, Back to Hogwarts Finally the day came when it was time to head back to Hogwarts for yet another exciting year of dealing with a threat to his very life. Unlike last year however Nick was starting the year out at the same level of power that an average seventh year student had in terms of pure magical power. He had accomplished this thanks to the boost he got from digesting the energy provided by the Nazgul ring, slowly this time to prevent any overfilling like the last time. While this sounds like a lot of power to have it should be noted that in terms of actual magical skill he was only equal to a fourth year student since he had mostly ever worked on his foundation despite his power. That was going to change this year though as Nick wanted to accelerate his magical skill to the same level as the average seventh year to match his current level of magical power. Unfortunately this will prove to be a hard goal to reach since the difficulty of each year's knowledge increases considerably past the third year. To put it simply the first three years were technically the adjustment period of the student's stay at Hogwarts to magic learning. The fourth year was when things got past the novice level and into the average point of each subject. As one would expect it was a small jump in difficulty that sadly many will get stuck at for whatever reason. Nick woke up at dawn as per his usual except this time he dressed himself in his Hogwarts uniform that he then transfigured to look like normal clothes to prevent any muggles from getting suspicious. He had already had Dottie and Dusk follow Helena to Hogwarts since they definitely wouldn't be allowed on the train. Looks like it's just you and me for right now Steve. Nick said to the Niffler that was stuffing his hoard into his stomach pouch. Nick waited for Steve to finish up before tossing the Niffler into his luggage and pulling the wheeled trunk out of the room. Ollivander was already waiting to take Nick to the train station with a smile. It has truly been a privilege to learn from you Mr. Ollivander. Nick said honestly with his hand held out for a handshake. Ollivander's smile widened as he took the offered hand firmly and it has been my honor to take part in guiding you towards whatever grand adventure surely awaits you. He said with no small amount of pride. They then operated to King's Cross Station and Nick wordlessly made his way through the pillar between platforms 9 and 10. The platform for the Hogwarts Express was already filled with aurors prepared to make sure that nothing strange happened to the students boarding the train but was pretty much empty otherwise. Oh, it seems I get the pick of the litter this time, nice, he thought with a smile as he boarded the train and chose a compartment at the back as he preferred. Most people like to get the compartments as far up the train as possible for some reason and Nick preferred the back instead to avoid the hassle of people constantly checking to see if the room was taken yet. I wonder if Daphne and Tracy will seek me out when they get here he pondered as he watched more and more students entering the platform and separating from their families while they boarded the train. He saw a few that he recognized such as Lee Jordan and Seamus Finnegan but most were upper years or first years. Now that I think about I never really paid much attention to people outside of my small group of friends last year. Not that that I planned to this year but I hadn't really noticed it until now. Nick thought seeing clearly older students and yet not recognizing most of them. Soon enough though he watched as Hermione, Daphne and Tracy all entered the platform nearly at the same moment. He watched in amusement as Hermione looked over the train and saw him sitting against the window of his compartment with a smile on his face. Obviously she pointed him out to the other two girls who brightened up and started to drag their trunks behind them to the compartment he was in. Soon enough the door to the compartment opened and revealed the girls. Good morning everyone, I hope you have all had a pleasant summer. Nick said with a smile before casting the levitation charm on their trunks and directing them into the shelves overhead. Daphne and I heard a rumor that you have been rather busy over the summer, something about freeing the Lord of House Black and setting right a decade old wrong if I remember correctly. Tracy said with a teasing smile. Chapter 214, Outnumbered. Is that right? And who might I ask would spread such clearly exaggerated rumors? Nick asked playing innocent. The papers were quite clear that that whole affair was Minister Fudge's doing and I wasn't even mentioned in the paper. He said with a grin. It was Ron, he and Harry wrote to us about it afterwards along with talking about some actions of yours that left us rather hurt. Daphne said calmly. Nick sighed while I regret a lot of the circumstances surrounding that event there was no other way to do it. 
the only person in our group who should have had to bear the weight of those actions was myself alone and if it was needed I would do so again. He said with a determined look that none of the girls could bring themselves to argue in the face of. But enough of that nonsense do tell all about what you've all done this summer since my summer was pretty boring. He said changing the subject easily. Tracy and I most just finished our homework and relaxed all summer so not really a whole lot to tell. Also weren't you learning how to make wands from Garrick Olivander of all people? How was your summer boring, is he that bad of a teacher? Daphne asked curiously. Nick laughed not at all, he is a fantastic teacher. I even got my Veridology license. Nick said showing them his recently updated license that now had three golden stars on it each with a large O in them. Daphne and Tracy both looked dumbfounded but Hermione only looked impressed but not like she understood the meaning of the stars or letters in them. I swear that it's like you aren't even human sometimes, like how in Merlin's name are you already as good as a person with three or four years experience in only so many months. Tracy asked in exasperation and Daphne was nodding in agreement. Speaking of which do you want me to let you all in on a juicy bit of gossip in regards to this? Nick asked with a Cheshire grin that told them volumes of his amusement at the information. They all nodded expectantly Ron's only sister came in to get matched with her wand and would you like to guess what sort of wand she got? He said making them start spewing out guesses. All wrong answers I'm afraid, good tries though. No the wand Ron's sister got was in fact none other than one that I made. Nick said and drank in the sight of all of their dumbfounded expressions with a content smile. There was honestly few things more satisfying to see than one's friends in awe of oneself. Oh you should have seen the look on Ron's face when he found out. It was simply priceless. Nick said with a laugh. It was at this point in time that the door opened again and in walked one Luna Lovegood. Nick immediately retracted his magic to below his skin and out of her perception when he saw her but otherwise didn't react much to her appearance. I would like to sit here. Luna said looking at the spot next to Nick on the seat. Feel free to help yourself Miss Lovegood I'm sure my friends won't mind all that much. He said and his friends each cocked their heads slightly to the side in confusion since they had no clue who Luna was and yet Nick did. I helped her match with her current wand last month. He explained and they all finally got it and agreed to let Luna join them. It was only after Luna sat down that he realized he was literally surrounded by girls with the only other male in the compartment being Steve who was currently getting pampered by Daphne with a content expression. Trader Nick thought with a slight twitch in his eyebrow at the Niffler's willingness to submit to the tender mercies of soft-hearted girls. Still despite this Nick was mostly unbothered by it since each of the girls were far too young to interest him in a romantic or sexual manner. If this situation were to occur say three or four years in the future and that may be very different since anyone with eyes could tell each of these girls would grow into true beauties. Luna Lovegood Luna introduced herself in her normal dreamy tone that clearly caught the others off guard much to Nick's amusement. The others introduced themselves and Nick's friends began to familiarize themselves with Luna until the train began to leave the station at which point they realized that Harry and Ron never showed up. Perhaps they are in another car avoiding me. Nick suggested which sounded reasonable despite him meaning something totally different. Chapter 215, Accidentally Discovered Ability The girls easily accepted this answer since Ron and Harry were sort of giving Nick the cold shoulder last they knew. Soon enough the food trolley came by and Nick treated everyone to some chocolate bars, apple juice and sandwiches while also buying up several boxes of every flavored beans so they could play blind man's luck. Luna needed to be taught the rules but once she was she turned out to be a menace to play against as her ability to somehow sense the future made her nigh unbeatable. Her divination talent came as no surprise to Nick since it was pretty heavily implied in the books. It was never actually explained how but in the books she always seemed to know what was going on at any given moment even without an explanation and while some of that could be attributed to her reading the emotions of others the rest was clearly something else. Innate divination abilities was the closest possible magical ability he could find to describe how she did this. Perhaps it wasn't so pronounced to the degree Grindelwald's own ability was where he could literally see into the future but she was certainly gifted in the field extraordinarily. Luna seemed to use this future sense of her to predict what color the beans were as well as which bean was foul tasting. Honestly speaking this was pretty much as close to cheating at the game as you could get but he couldn't oust her due to lacking any real tangible evidence. That didn't mean he had to play the game against her however and as such was always the bystander when she played. The other girls warmed up to Luna pretty easily once they got past the weird talks about magical creatures that had no evidence to exist and whatever the hell Nargles were. Nick found it almost cute how Luna kept trying to get him to show her his magical energy in various ways. The best one in his opinion, though that might be his pride at fault, was when she talked about how it was the prettiest color she had ever seen and that she really wanted to see it again. 
He messed with her after that by very precisely controlling his magical energy to form minute shapes on his skin such as a snake slithering around him or a when he tried to make it appear like lightning flashing across his body. That last one caused an actually physical manifestation of that exact element however startling everyone including himself. That's new. Nick said awkwardly while he was stared at by everyone in the compartment. You just live to make the rest of us feel small don't you? Tracy complained in envy. Even Daphne couldn't help but nod her head in agreement at this since Nick was frankly speaking already an insane existence and now he seemed to have yet another new magical ability besides whatever the hell that creepy sixth sense of his was. She was completely choosing to ignore the frightening command of birds he also had and never tried to hide. Daphne had seen birds drop out of the sky to greet Nick before he dismissed them and the only thing even remotely similar she knew about was parcel tongue but that was snakes and many levels worse than whatever this ability was. So lighting hey? That's a pretty cool ability if you can like summon and control storms and stuff. Luna said and Nick stiffened for a moment. He had actually somehow forgotten that Thunderbirds could control weather until now and as such never actually tried to do that until technically just a few moments ago. Until now the only lightning he had used was that of the spell he accidentally discovered quite a while ago. Please tell me you can't actually summon storms and control them. Tracy whined almost begging him to say that was ridiculous. She was going to be disappointed however I... Don't think so. Probably. He said not actually sure if he could or not. Tracy seemed to lose all hope and devolved into muttering about how unfair the world was. Can you make a rainbow? Luna asked while looking at Nick with her best puppy dog eyes. Nick felt his heart skip a beat due to the sheer cuteness overload. Have a cookie. He said stressed out while handing her a cookie from greed which seemed to be enough to placate the girl. Okay so I'm going to be totally honest with you all. I don't actually know what all abilities I do or do not possess save a couple. I'm willing to take suggestions if you can think of any ideas. Nick said with a sigh since he was sort of coming clean about him having more than one ability. Chapter 216, New Abilities This wasn't an arbitrary decision made in the heat of the moment since Nick has been wanting to reveal his abilities to his friends to a degree anyways. Obviously Luna's inclusion into this matter was unexpected but something told him that she would have learned all of this eventually anyways so it didn't bother him much. He wasn't going to expose his ability to speak and read any language or the exact extent by which his magical senses worked but he had no problem with most of the others. Tracy let out an exasperated sigh when she heard him but Luna just giggled. I knew you were cheating. No one is that good at magic as soon as they get to Hogwarts. So spill it, how does this crazy ability of yours work? Tracy asked Smug in the knowledge that he was merely innately gifted and not just really hard working. Nick shut down that immediately though it doesn't work like that Tracy so wipe that smug look off your face. Sure it helps but I do still have to put in the work to learn magic so it's not all talent but also hard work. He said and she looked stricken. Daphne giggled at this since she had expected as much herself but wanted to see Tracy's reaction when she learned it too. You still cheated though. Tracy said refusing to just accept that she was wrong. Nick chuckled not really my starting point is merely different than all of yours is all. Ignoring that I am quite interested to know what other abilities you all can think of. He said with a curious expression. Parcel tongue. Daphne asked and Nick shook his head to show that he didn't have it. What about that weird closeness you have with birds? Tracy asked having also long noticed it. I suppose that could be considered an ability. I call it avian dominion since all it does is make me the king of all avian creatures which is to say birds mostly. Nick explained honestly. That sounds nice. Luna said with a smile. It has its uses. He agreed. Well you have that whole lightning thing you did but about about fire or water. Daphne asked and Nick held out his hand and shaped his magical energy on his palm like water but nothing happened. He then tried it with fire and much like with lightning a small flame immediately sprang to life above his palm yet didn't burn him at all. That makes sense at least since I am pretty sure this ability to summon fire and lightning was inherited from the celestial bird spirit that fused into my soul he thought while playing with the small flame curiously. Ugh. I'm so jealous. Tracy complained loudly. Nick merely chuckled and retracted his magic back under his skin snuffing out the magical flames above his palm. You must be sure to only use these abilities to do good. Hermione said as if actually had any idea what she was talking about. I don't exactly plan to go around tossing bolts of lightning at random people for fun you know. Honestly don't understand the appeal to be honest burnt flesh smells terrible. Nick joked and Luna, Daphne and Tracy all laughed while Hermione huffed but didn't argue. You never did say whether or not you could summon or control the weather. 
Luna pointed out and Nick looked at the partly cloudy sky outside and while channeling his magic to his entire body he imagined a dark and thunderous sky. Nothing happened at first so he thought he was doing it wrong or simply didn't have that ability but then he felt a massive drop in his energy before the wind outside the train began to howl and grey clouds visibly formed. Nick fearfully cut off the supply of energy with a pale expression as his was almost bone dry from that amount of weather manipulation. Taking a few deep breaths to stop himself from panting in exhaustion he fought to keep his eyes open. The girls noticed the change in the weather but also how drained Nick looked from what couldn't have been more than a few seconds of using this ability. I am going to stay away from that one for a long time, by Merlin's saga beard I'm tired. He said honestly and the girls all agreed that he shouldn't use this ability right now. Still to think you could actually mess with the weather, are you sure you aren't the next Merlin or Dumbledore? Tracy asked teasingly. Nah, too much work to be a crowd pleaser like that. I think I'll stick to being barely recognized for my power thank you very much. Nick said half jokingly half very seriously. Chapter 218 a Foul Headache POV Dumbledore This summer break had proven to be quite interesting to say the least for himself he had to admit. First was the capture of Peter and the release of Sirius and now it would seem as if that strange young man has managed to somehow obtain a ho-ho of all things during that time. Dumbledore thought while looking at the rooster-sized black and red bird happily chirping back and forth with Fox in his office. According to Helena Ravenclaw this immortal bird may well be older than Fox as it was given to her mother over a thousand years ago he thought seriously. Dumbledore remembered Dusk arriving at the castle alongside Helena and a house elf named Dottie this morning clearly. He was sitting at his desk going over the paperwork he had recently about various topics from the release of Sirius to the movements of Grindelwald's forces. Fox alerted him mere moments before Dusk flew into the room from the perpetually open window at the top of his office's area. Dumbledore was not afraid to admit that his eyes widened to a large degree and his jaw dropped in surprise. How could he not be shocked when he was very much aware of the solitary nature of each of the immortal bird species? Having a member of the immortal birds casually show up out of nowhere for seemingly no reason was enough to cause even an experienced wizard like him to short-circuit for a moment. Fox on the other hand made his presence known to the interloper but was seemingly quite surprised when the ho-ho looked genuinely happy to meet him. It was only after Helena arrived that Dumbledore understood why this was. A fact that only those in power really knew was the reason immortal birds stayed with their parents until adulthood. Immortal birds had what were known as nirvanic personalities which in simply terms meant that how they were taught and shaped through their first lifespan carried over permanently forever. This meant that giving someone an immortal bird chick was not a simple trait of a magical creature from one to another but a show of faith that the receiver won't twist the bird permanently into a powerful evil force. Clearly Dusk had been raised alone and with very little love at all as if he wasn't an intelligent creature but a simple-minded beast. He wasn't evil but starved of true companionship and bitter at the world over it. This meant that when he found companionship he held onto it tightly and would get violent at outside interference which Dumbledore learned personally. He was now sporting a slightly shorter beard after Dusk's warning strike when he tried to get the bird to leave his office while it was communicating with Fox. Like master like bird it seems he thought remembering how badly Nick had reacted to his actions as well. Needless to say he had quite the headache to say the least as he was helpless to do anything about the bird in his office. The worst part however was definitely the nightmare that was the fact Dusk went everywhere with Nick according to Helena. There was honestly no way that the bird wouldn't cause a huge commotion during classes. The even worse part though was the need to convince Hagrid to stay away from the bird lest it disembowel the half-giant after being pestered one too many times. For all the large man's way with magical beasts he was rather dense when it came to figuring out when to stay away from them on his own. None of this however mattered in the face of a piece of information that Helena accidentally gave him. Nick had somehow managed to allow a ghost take on a corporeal form. The sheer number of frightening implications this had was enough to cause Dumbledore to break out in cold sweats. Thankfully however the means Nick used to accomplish this did not restore the ability to cast spells to the ghost it was used on since there was no wand on Helena at all. He probably used that mysterious enchantment method of his. He thought seriously. If before Nick's enchantment method had been interesting now it was dangerous in the wrong hands in Dumbledore's opinion. He of course knew that Nick was almost paranoid in the lengths he went to in order to prevent his method leaking but the fact remained that the information was a potential threat. For now though Dumbledore decided to place his trust in Nick to protect the world from his own knowledge. Now to try and coax this ho-ho out of my office without getting another beard trim. He thought with a small headache. Chapter 219, Back The weather cleared up pretty fast once Mother Nature took over and wiped away all signs of his tampering. 
The rest of the trip to Hogwarts was fairly uneventful as despite the girls naming off any magical ability they could think of Nick systematically crossed them off as things he didn't have. When the train arrived at Hogsmeade Station Luna separated from the group and joined the rest of the first years in the boats. Hermione however quickly noticed that Harry and Ron weren't even on the train and was worried about them. I'm sure they will show up later in some spectacular fashion. Nick reassured her with a grin. She knew he was probably right considering the two people in question but still was worried. Nick meanwhile was already planning how to snatch the diary away from Ginny before she has the chance to let it corrupt her into opening the chamber. The problem wasn't Ginny in this case but the soul shard in the diary. As the first horcrux this soul shard was basically the same version of Voldemort that was mostly sane and incredibly versed in advanced magics. This also meant that if it figured out that Nick was hunting it the shard may flip the table to escape and do more than just petrify people with the giant magical serpent below the school. Obviously this was the worst case scenario but Nick still needed to take it into consideration. Most likely however he would simply stun the girl when she was alone and remove the diary from her without anyone being the wiser. The best part however was despite the diary's magical cloaking abilities Nick could still easily sense the evil magic that filled it like a torch in a dark room so he will know the best time to grab it. Petting the Thestrals pulling the carriages Nick and the rest of the group made their way to Hogwarts eager to start another year. While the first years were getting sorted Nick noticed Snape entering the Great Hall and speaking with Knoggle and Dumbledore of which neither looked happy about. Leaning over to Hermione he whispered in her ear and there's the flashy reappearance. Before chuckling at her reaction that was a mix of embarrassed and angry. She was embarrassed at how close he had gotten and angry because Harry and Ron had clearly done something bad again. Much like in the original story Luna was placed in House Ravenclaw while Ginny was placed in Gryffindor. Clearly however everyone in the castle quickly learned what Harry and Ron had done either from the paper or when Gnoggle told her house. Most of the Gryffindor house thought it was an awesome way to come to Hogwarts and even planned to congratulate the two when they got into the common room. Nick and Hermione would not be a part of that for two different reasons that were fairly similar but not exactly. For Hermione it was because she wanted to lecture them about breaking the rules and almost getting expelled for it. For Nick it was because they chose the literal stupidest way possible to come to Hogwarts in their panic. First off Harry had an owl and could have easily sent a letter in a hurry that would fix the problem. The second was that all they needed to do was literally wait for the Weasley adults by the car. There was obviously no way Mr. Weasley would leave his prized enchanted car behind and thus would have found and gotten the boys sent on their way easily enough. Nick had honestly thought that the presence of him and the girls would have fixed this event but clearly he was mistaken. Still despite this the biggest commotion wasn't from the boys' method of transportation but rather when Dusk entered the Great Hall and perched himself on Nick's shoulder while rubbing his head against Nick's face affectionately. Most people didn't know what he was at first but Anthony Goldstein exclaimed what Dusk was and it caused chaos. The best reaction in Nick's opinion though had to be Lockhart who looked like he had just taken a big bite out of a rotten lemon. Nick had to stop more than a few people from trying to touch Dusk as despite the bird's patience on Nick's behalf that was still a sure way to draw its ire. Nick loudly explained this to everyone in the hall and the outstretched fingers were quickly hidden into fist away from the bird that would be more than happy to remove them. After that Nick got a lot of jealous glares as he ate and also fed Dusk that was nearly just as gluttonous as Nick himself. I do tend to attract gluttons it seems he thought with a chuckle. Chapter 220, Confrontation Gnoggle also passed out the reintroduction schedule for the second years which included Nick and his friends. After that the schedule would go back to the way it was for the previous year minus a slight adjustment in the times. For the first week though it was headache-inducing cramming on the menu. An example of this was Monday in which they had herbology followed by potions and the finally Dada. Nick was especially not looking forward to herbology since they were going to be working with actually dangerous plants this year and he didn't exactly get along with most magical plant life. Thankfully the first class was going to involve repotting mandrix and so he didn't risk getting attacked by anything save the venomous tentacula that was apparently teething. For those not versed in magical plants, I don't blame you, venomous tentacula were a special vining type plant that had legitimate fangs growing from its vines that it used to poison and kill prey to turn into nutrients. As if that wasn't bad enough the things had one of the nastiest poisons to be hit with that many who were too far from help have died to. Obviously Hogwarts had an antidote handy on the off chance someone gets bitten by the plant in the exact same greenhouse the plant was kept. Despite knowing how poorly Lockhart's class was going to go with that whole pixie event from the book Nick was much more worried about the plants. Unlike how it seemed in the book Cornish pixies were actually fairly easy to deal with so long as you knew any shield charm as well as stunning charm of which Nick had both. Got to deal with the boys before I go planning for the future though he thought shaking his head to clear away distracting thoughts like those he normally gets. 
At the moment he was sitting on his bed in his sleepwear waiting for Harry and Ron to walk into the dorm room. Both of them had smiles on their faces as they entered the room but froze when they saw two pairs of golden eyes staring them down. Both boys lost all sense of joy from being congratulated by most of their house when they saw this as they had been dreading this moment for most of the summer. There was no running nor could they choose to ignore Nick since he was going to be with them for most of every day save the weekends. I see you have snapped your wand, hand it over so I can see if I might be able to salvage it. Nick said calmly while holding out his hand. Ron looked hesitant but still did so and Nick got to diagnosing the problems with it. The core is torn and the housing is fubar, fucked up beyond all recognition, at this point with even the runes being damaged. You may kill yourself with even the simplest spell should you continue using this wand. He said calmly while handing the thing back to Ron who paled. You are in luck however as I have a few wands that I created that may serve as a suitable replacement. Nick added and began to take out two dozen boxes of wands from Greed. Ollivander hadn't minded selling the finished wands Nick made to him at cost since he hadn't put any effort into the things. As a result Nick had a small collection of exactly one wand with every core and wood combination available. While the length of the wands would be all wrong beggars couldn't be choosers in Ron's case. Now that that's been taken care of I believe it's about time we put this problem between us to bed. I did the best I could with the situation and wish I hadn't needed to keep it from all of you. I apologize for deceiving you both in that manner but that burden belongs on my shoulders alone. Nick said seriously. Both Harry and Ron looked conflicted as though trapped between a forgiving him and cursing at him for his actions. The problem however was that they had had time to really think about the situation and had come to the bitter realization that they were in fact untrustworthy in regards to that information. Both of them knew that they simply didn't have it in them to grin and bear it in the face of Peter's actions and would have likely ruined everything in the process. That was honestly the part they were most bitter about. Not what Nick did but rather that he had needed to do it without them to succeed. They were tired but this truly needed to be settled before they could move forward with their friendship. Chapter 221, The Outcome After a few awkward minutes the two boys vented their grievances to Nick and now it was his turn to be uncomfortably as they talked about how he hadn't even tried to get them to help as well as how he was practically a different person than when they met him after getting his heritage revealed. An entire year's worth of problems were spat out into the open in a short period of time and even Neville who had no part in this matter couldn't help but get introspective much less Nick who was the source of the problems. There was all lot going on with me last year, political nonsense, puberty in a sense, bloody hell did you know I have had no less than 20 marriage proposals? Add on to all of that the fact no one had even noticed petty grew under their noses for an entire decade and I was rather stressed to say the least. Nick said frustrated at being called out so thoroughly. Sure most of what had been said was small things like how he was always so busy or distracted even when he hung out with them but it was still hard to hear. And what about us, hey? What are we supposed to do when it feels like you are so far ahead of us that we may as well bloody well not even try to keep up? Ron asked angrily. Nick froze at this as he had simply never thought about how it must feel to watch someone who was supposed to be your friend accelerate by leaps and bounds ahead of you while you could only watch helplessly. You don't need to keep up with me, you never did. Just like what I told Hermione last year you aren't me and can't do what I can so don't try. Instead do what you are good at and that is all you need. Nick said with a sigh. It's not just me either but this applies to everyone, Harry, Daphne, Fred and George everyone. You are not those people you are Ronald Weasley so do what you can do and that's enough. Learn at your own pace, grow and experience life as you please. You only get one chance normally so don't waste it chasing after a shadow that belongs to someone else. Nick added sincerely. Things got all sappy and uncomfortable after that but to summarize their relationship had been patched up nicely by the time they were done talking. The next morning was a weekend day so Nick didn't have many plans besides fixing up his workshop with the stuff he had taken over the summer break such as his furnace that now had the new flame type available for use. Conjunction fire was rather unique in how it operated during forging. Unlike most fires that granted properties that can be expected from them because of their natures it did no such thing. Instead conjunction flames made the metal forged with them more attuned to spatial energies and enchantments. Needless to say Nick was very much planning to abuse this trait to the greatest extent possible. At the moment however he was readjusting his workshop using his new knowledge of traditional enchanting to set up a sort of metallic frame around the room that he had quickly forged with the conjunction fire so that he could expand the space inside the workshop greatly. The reason this frame was necessary for this was because Hogwarts Castle itself was extremely resistant to foreign enchantments and tended to shake them off quickly when they would otherwise last years. As a result Nick was cheating and actually only going to be expanding the space inside the metal frame rather than the actual room itself. 
Professor Flitwick had offered to help set it up since he found the idea to be a clever workaround. Nick wasn't familiar with space expansion charms so that was where the good professor came in to make the place nearly quadruple its original size. This let Nick now have enough room to set up a woodworking station and material stockpile without it being affected by the metal side. Nick was also willing to admit that he may have grown a tad used to a certain quality to his woodworking equipment while at Ollivanders and refused to go back to whittling wooden rings so crudely. He still needed to purchase the equipment and wait for it to be ready before sending Dottie to bring it to Hogwarts but the room was at least ready for it now. Unlike normally though Nick wasn't in the workshop alone as most of his friends and also Luna were all there being a pain in the ass messing with his stuff. Chapter 222, First Day Disaster Besides dealing with Hermione who was constantly trying to drill sense into Harry and Ron's heads Nick also had to keep Luna from getting killed by Dusk as she thinks he looks like he needs a hug and wasn't understanding that that would be the last hug she ever gave if Dusk had his way. That bird really didn't like being touched by anyone other than Nick and made it clear after warning the offending party. Nick had heard from Helena the sort of warning Dusk had given Dumbledore and didn't want to have to explain to Madame Pomfret why Luna had magical fire burn marks on her skin. Things would have been fine if it hadn't been for Peeves sneaking up on Dusk and yanking out one of his long tail feathers. The bird went absolutely ballistic as fire exploded out of it and it angrily started chasing the poltergeist down the hallway launching gouts of flames without care for collateral damage after him. It got so bad that Nkanagal had to get involved to save the rest of the school from the wrath of a very pissed off Ho-Ho. Her solution was to put him in time out effectively by transfiguring an unburnable stone box around Dusk. I believe I made it clear that you were to keep this ho-ho under control Mr. Ravenclaw. Knoggle questioned with a glare behind her spectacles. Nick could only smile helplessly and explain what had set Dusk off so badly. After listening to the full story Knoggle merely sighed in frustration before turning the much less homicidal but otherwise still fuming Dusk over to Nick. She then left to go deal with Peeves who was the entire reason an angry immortal bird had rampaged through the hallways. Releasing Dusk from the transfigured box Nick finally got a good look at the tail feather area and sighed when he saw the bloody place on the side of it that had been ripped out. He gave Dusk some wig and weld to close the wound before bringing the very unhappy bird to see Madame Pomfrey. The older woman gave Nick a strange look when he walked into the infirmary before speaking. You don't look sick nor injured, please tell me it's not another strange thing like last year. She said worriedly. Nick shook his head it's not me this time but Dusk here. He said pointing at the large red and black bird sulking on his shoulder. Madame Pomfrey raised an eyebrow at this before walking over and examining Dusk from head to tail before pausing when she saw the bloody and still very fresh wound. Peeves Nick explained before she could angrily ask what had happened. The nurse grit her teeth clearly not doubting what he said at all and walked to the back of the infirmary and came back with a potion and a small tin of bluish cream. Dusk glared threateningly at her angrily but she merely scoffed at him before addressing Nick. Give him a quarter of this potion in the morning for the next four days and when the flesh men's use this bomb on the skin to promote regeneration for the week after you started. I am sorry to say that I can't do anything about the feather however as Peeves pulled out its root as well. She said while handing him the items. Nick stored them in greed and thanked her for her help on Dusk's behalf even if the bird was in a foul mood. Madame Pomfrey merely waved it off however by saying it was her job before shooing him out of the infirmary. Fox meanwhile also got angry when Knoggle had reported to Dumbledore what had happened while handing over the feather she had retrieved from Peeves. It was about a foot long and the base of it still had flesh and dried blood on it. To say that Dumbledore was displeased would be an understatement as he more than most understood the value an immortal bird put on their feathers as well as which ones were most precious to them. Fox had only ever allowed two feathers to be plucked from him and those were the least precious ones on his body. Every ho-ho much like phoenixes placed a massive amount of importance in their tail feathers so getting them forcefully ripped out would definitely set one off no matter how peaceful originally. Dusk was definitely not a very peaceful bird to begin with so Dumbledore wasn't surprised by his outburst at all. It seems heavy punishment is in order for Peeves as his actions this time placed many at great risk of injury or worse. I will ask Severus to choose a fitting punishment as he will surely treat Peeves most harshly out of us all. Dumbledore said with no room for debate not that Nkanagal was going to defend the poltergeist after such a dangerous action. Chapter 223, A Bad Start Is he all right? Daphne asked seeing how Dusk kept looking at the bald spot where his tail feather had been sadly. Nick rubbed the bird's chest comfortingly as he replied he isn't in any danger or anything but he had lost a very important part of himself so until he gets it back by undergoing rebirth it is going to really bother him. Nick said honestly. How long will that take? Tracy asked also concerned. Technically he could do so at any time however doing so before his body finishes reaching maturity is bad for him. Nick explained. 
so how long until he reaches maturity then? Harry asked. About a month or so since it only takes a few months for an immortal bird to return to their prime after their rebirth. Nick said while distracting Dusk with some rabbit meat he got from Hagrid. The half-giant had heard about what had happened and wanted to cheer Dusk up a bit as the big man couldn't stand the thought of a magical beast suffering like that for no good reason. It was rather funny seeing this first meeting between Dusk and Hagrid as the bird clearly didn't know what to make of him. Sighing deeply Nick complained this year isn't off to a great start at all. And his friends couldn't help but nod in agreement as this was a poor first day back at the castle. The rest of the day went by with little more fuss but it had already been ruined by the earlier events. Meanwhile later that night Celebrimber showed up in Nick's dream with a scolding look. I am ashamed that you would even consider such horrendous thing. Vile though that Peeves' actions may be I doubt it deserves to be erased from existence. He said sternly. Nick sighed maybe not but I can't just leave the bastard alone after this I need to do something to get back at him. Nick argued angrily. No matter what punishment the staff give the poltergeist it simply won't change anything as Peeves' very nature was to sow chaos. Nick wanted him gone one way or another and erasing the creature was the easiest option. Hmm, perhaps you could create a construct to imprison the creature permanently. Celebrimber offered and Nick thought about it. I'd need to know more about what a poltergeist actually is before I could attempt it but it should be possible. He admitted. Nick woke up after that and got dressed and ready for his first class of the day after breakfast, herbology. This basically meant gloves, protective rings and an subtle transfiguration on his robes to turn them into hard carbon instead of cotton on his back and arms leaving him protected. Without messing with the robes movement. This caused his robes to be shiny but no one said anything when they went to breakfast. Dusk was very unhappy after taking his dose of medicine for the day as it was apparently very bitter. Still the bird cheered up a little during breakfast when he basically appropriated a whole tray of sausages for himself. This didn't stop anyone else from getting food though as apparently the house elves had been informed to make slight more than usual to accommodate the bird. Nick and his friends ate while the mail arrived and Nick was surprised to see that he received a package but when he saw the sender's name he brightened up and put it in greed without opening it. What was that? Ron asked curiously. Just something I put an order in for over the summer. Nick said casually and the redhead merely shrugged and accepted that answer since it made sense with Nick's actions. If he already knew what the item was there was no need for him to open it in front of everyone to see. Nick meanwhile gave the grey owl that delivered it a few pieces of bacon a good scratch and sent it on its way. What he wasn't telling Ron however was that the package was from Sirius and the tag attached simply read the goblet telling Nick all he needed to know if his magical senses hadn't already told him. Nick wasn't the only one to receive mail however as Ron received a bright red envelope that made him have a dreadful look and many others who knew what it was also actively shied away from it. Nick had never seen a howler before and examined it with his magical senses and was stupefied at how stupidly complex the enchantment on the thing was for a scolding tool. There was no less than five different effects to the enchantment, written to speech, sound amplification, autonomous flotation, and self-destruction. Chapter 224, Animagus Temptation Ron reluctantly opened the red envelope and the thing floated up into the air above his head and immediately Nick cast a spell to transfigure earmuffs over his and Dusk's ears. This proved to be a good idea as they were in the loudest spot across from Ron. Ronald Weasley. How dare you? A voice boomed out of the letter so loudly that the table under it rattled and Nick could feel the words as they were spoken. It was a fairly long stern lecture from Mrs. Weasley that had Ron and Harry both shrunk down in the seats in mortification. Once the tirade was through the letter violently tore itself to pieces before those pieces burst into ash. Nick removed his transfiguration and Dusk nodded his head in appreciation for being spared the deafening sound of the letter. Breakfast was basically over at that point and Nick, Ron, Harry and Hermione went to leave the Great Hall. But somehow against all rules of self-preservation Malfoy decided to come antagonize Harry and Ron. The boy was apparently wise enough to leave Nick out of it or maybe the death-threatening glare of Dusk persuaded him, who knows. Nick couldn't help but sigh when he saw Lockhart following Professor Sprout from the area of the Whomping Willow. Ah. Good morning children I was just helping the good professor treat the injuries of the Whomping Willow as I have dealt with several of the species during my travels. Not to say that I myself am more knowledgeable than an expert like Professor Sprout of course. Lockhart said with a gigawatt smile that actually shined somehow. The overblown fool then held Harry back for a talk while the rest of the class went into one of the locked greenhouses labeled three. Inside the greenhouse was several rows of moving leafy plants in dried out soil and a few other plants off against the walls of the greenhouse. Nick eyed the venomous tentacula suspiciously to make sure it was far away from him at all times as he took his position. 
The lesson proceed as per normal after that with Professor Sprout and Hermione explaining what mandrakes were though Nick decided to stir the pot a bit and say something interesting that wasn't shared. Raising his hand Professor Sprout looked pleasantly surprised before letting him talk. Hermione forgot to say that besides those uses the mandrix leaves also have a very significant use in a rather interesting piece of transfiguration, animagus transformation. In fact they are a key ingredient in the process. Nick said with a grin and saw the professor stiffen at the mention of this. You are of course five points to Greyfinder, that being said I can assure everyone that that is a dangerous process and it would be best to speak with Professor Mkanagal about it for further information. She said after recovering though Nick did get a warning look that told him she knew why he had shared that information. Honestly speaking Nick simply found it far too much of a waste that so few people chose to undergo the process and wanted to see if he could fix this by pushing his classmates onto the path. Nick himself wanted to undergo the ritual himself but he had learned that now that he wasn't human anymore he needed to modify every ritual he underwent from now on to his new race. It wasn't a huge modification honestly but he had to delve into arithmancy to make it. Like all math however the subject was a headache to improve in. It also didn't help that for the animagus ritual Nick also needed to modify it to include the magical phenomena of magical beast birth. That part thankfully was much easier since he found a few books on the subject in the ancient section last year but hadn't read them. He intended to subject himself to that phenomena before he underwent the animagus ritual so that he would become a magical beast instead of a normal one. Though before any of that I need to call my patroness to make sure I will become what I think I will he thought after leaving herbology totally unharmed thanks to his precautions. Knoggle's class was a breeze for Nick and Hermione though the same couldn't be said of the others. They were supposed to turn a beetle into a button and after a few months without practice their classmates were a bit rusty to say the least. Nick turned his beetle into a shining silver button with tiny highly detailed beetles on it which like always impressed Mkanagal earning Greyfinder an extra 10 points before he basically relaxed the rest of the class while giving helpful reminders of the previous year's lessons. Chapter 225, Foolish Lockhart These reminders helped his classmates greatly in jogging their memories of the subject making them not fail as badly as they would have without them. Ron's performance was night and day with what is was in the book with him having a functional wand this time. He still had trouble of course but no more than anyone else really. Hermione being her normal overachieving self was transfiguring her beetles into different colored buttons of different sizes as well. She's going to take it pretty badly in a bit when we have Lockhart's class. Nick thought with a chuckle. He was just going to leave his paper blank in Lockhart's class as he neither cared about the man nor felt the need to add to his ego. If Lockhart tried to call him out for this Nick had no problem at all pointing out that the man's job was to teach them defense against the dark arts and literally nothing more. As a result when he saw that none of the questions were about the subject felt no need to pay it any attention. It was not only a valid answer but also pointed out the man's lack of professionalism, two birds with one stone. Things played out a little differently when they went to the man's class after lunch however. Ah Mr. Ravenclaw just the person I needed to speak with. Lockhart said with a wide smile when Nick and his friends approached the classroom. Judging from the shifty way his eyes kept going to dusk on Nick's should Nick doubted this would go very well. You see I heard about the incident yesterday with your pet here and assumed I would graciously offer to take it off your hands since it requires an exceptional wizard such as myself to tame such a beast. Lockhart said eagerly. Before Nick could even say anything however the man had the audacity to actually reach his hand out to try and grab dusk like he was some common chicken. Dusk wasted no time at all flaring up with his flames causing the pompous blonde the retreat in fear. Nick smiled and stroked Dusk's chest to calm him down before looking at Lockhart. Your first mistake was assuming that Dusk is a pet and not a companion. The mistake after that was assuming I was the one who gets to dictate where he goes and more importantly with whom. And your final mistake was attempting to lay a single finger on him without his permission which is a big taboo with all immortal birds as I'm sure someone so accomplished would know. Nick said condescendingly before walking into the room and sitting next to Harry who high-fived him. Nick spoke nothing but the truth about Dusk just now because that was all that was needed. Nick didn't own Dusk and was not in fact in control of him in any regard, the bird was with him of its own free will and as a result was equally free to leave if it wished. More than a few girls were glaring at Nick as though it was his fault that Lockhart made a fool of himself in view of the whole class. Ugh. Fucking fang girls are the worst he thought disdainfully before choosing to ignore them and split a cookie with Harry as Lockhart made his way to the front of the room. Nick had to give the man credit as he played off that whole incident as a test on his part when it clearly wasn't. After that though the class went nearly exactly as he expected with Lockhart passing out that ridiculous test of his and Nick not even putting his name on the paper. After taking all of the papers it became clear to Nick that the man had kept an eye out for his paper. Mr. Ravenclaw where is your paper? 
he asked with a frown after going through the pile twice. I didn't do it. Nick said casually. Why not? Lockhart pressed clearly unhappy. It didn't have a single question on the class itself nor on any of your solutions to magical defense from your books. Nick said evenly. Minus ten points from Greyfinder, next time I expect you to do whatever work I assign you without any mistaken thoughts on the subject. Lockhart said with barely contained anger. Not to worry, it won't happen again. Nick said with a mocking smile. Lockhart snorted softly before switching back to his false persona and pulling out a large bird cage covered by a cloth. Within this cage lies a most terrible creature indeed be warned any movement might set them off. The man said trying to build suspense before pulling off the cloth. Chapter 226, Detention Pulling the cover off he spoke dramatically yes, freshly caught Cornish pixies. He said as revealed the tiny electric blue-winged humanoid creatures with sharp faces and shrill voices that sounded like parakeets arguing. When exposed to the light after that cover was removed they all went ballistic and chaotic as they stared at the students. Seamus Finnegan couldn't hold back his laughter anymore and Lockhart locked onto him yes. He questioned. Well they aren't really dangerous at all right? Seamus asked thinking this whole thing was a joke. Don't be so sure of that. Lockhart said with a smirk. Devilish tricky little blighters they can be. All right then. Let's see what you make of them. He then said loudly before making the mistake of opening the bird cage and setting the things free. Immediately the pixies burst out of the cage and immediately began causing chaos around the classroom. Nick casually waved his wand pro to go. And summoned a shield dome over his classmates but purposefully left Lockhart out of it. It only took a few of the pixies crashing into the shield to realize that the students were safe and turning their malicious gaze exclusively on Lockhart. Nick had to give the man credit in that he still tried to get off his bogus pixie removal spell before his wand was thrown out of the window by the creatures and they started tormenting him. A few of his fangirls tried to help him but all that got them was attacked by the pixies when Nick retracted the shield from them specifically. Manipulating the rough shape of a shield charm was a breeze since the wording of the spell made no mention as to its shape at all but rather only its function. Nick watched with a calm expression as Locke had his hair cut, pulled, and burned by the pixies that used a candle on it. They also stuffed quills up his nose and pantsed him in front of the whole class showing them his hymn-themed boxers. When the bell rang dismissing them Nick was the first to leave the class since Harry and him had sat at the back of the class near the door. The rest of his classmate hurriedly followed as the shield began to flicker dangerously without Nick fueling it anymore. The shield lasted right until the door of the classroom closed behind the last person sealing the pixies in the room with Lockhart and his fang girls. Ron was beaming at Nick that was bloody brilliant mate. What did you mean about it not happening again though? He asked curiously. Hmm? Oh. That was because I was planning to have detention during his class for the rest of the year, haven't figured out which teacher to ask though any suggestions. Nick answered casually. All of his friends and those listening in were left speechless at what he said as he while most people try to avoid detention he was planning to use it as an excuse to avoid Lockhart. That's a great idea. Why don't we all do that as well? Tracy suggested eagerly. Nick shook his head at this the only people here who might get away with this plan is myself and Hermione since we are already more advanced than the rest of our class so we don't strictly speaking need to attend his class. He explained honestly leaving them heartbroken at this truth. I for one think it's rude to Professor Lockhart and won't be doing that. Hermione said disapprovingly. Nick shrugged suit yourself, but do keep in mind the option is always available he said not minding. Nick continued chatting with his friends for a while as they all settled on Flitwick as the best option for this plan of Nick's. Separating from them to go have this chat with Flitwick Nick went to the third floor past his workshop to the man's office and knocked on the door. The door opened on its own and Nick saw Flitwick sitting at his desk going over papers from his other classes. The half-goblin looked up and saw Nick and smiled Nick it's good to see you. What can I do for you today? He asked curiously. Nick grinned now this may sound a bit weird but I need you to give me detention for the rest of the year. He said with a chuckle when Flitwick looked totally confused. To be more specific a sort of detention in which it just so happens to overlap with defense against the dark arts. Nick added and Flitwick sighed fool's already gotten under your skin it seems, well go on tell me what he's done that was so bad. The small professor said tiredly not even dismissing Nick's idea like he normally would. Chapter 227, Detention, 2 Nick helped himself to the chair across from Flitwick and spoke so I take it all the teachers are also aware of the man's foolishness then. Nick asked curiously. The small man scoffed of course we know about how unqualified the man is for the position, most of us were the ones who taught him. 
We are helpless in this matter however as that blasted curse makes sure we can't keep a teacher in the position for more than a year. The people willing to take the position is honestly minuscule as a result. He said with irritation. If that curse were removed and a truly suitable candidate found could Lockhart be sacked for incompetence and endangering students? Nick asked with a devious plan forming in his head. Flitwick didn't dismiss Nick's question since he had long learned that he operated on a totally different spectrum from normal wizards after witnessing the way his enchantment method worked last year. In theory the fool would need to do something truly dangerous involving his students but yes I could see Albus doing so if it were possible. Flitwick answered honestly. Nick grinned in a Cheshire manner hearing that and Flitwick knew the crazy boy had a plan. Don't keep me suspense lad what have you got rolling around in that head of yours at the moment? Flitwick asked eagerly. It just so happens that when I visited Gringotts to handle my family's account I learned a rather interesting secret about the founders. See they may have been willing to relinquish all legal ownership of the castle but they left back doors for their descendants to have more authority of the castle than any other student in the form of a blood imprint. The curse on the school is the result of he who must not be named correct. Nick asked and Flitwick nodded liking where this was going. As it turns out one of that man's claims was that he was a descendant of Salazar Slytherin which if true poised him perfectly to leave a curse in a way that only the descendant of another founder could remove. I as it so happens fit that category quite handily. Nick finished speaking and Flitwick was grinning ear to ear. Marvelous, truly fantastic. So when do you plan to rid us of this irritating curse and how can I help? The man asked eagerly. My plan involved waiting for Lockhart to be replaced before working together with the headmaster to isolate and expunge the curse since I am admittedly unable to tell where it is since it was already a part of the wards when I first arrived. Dumbledore however is quite likely to have seen the changes made personally and as such is uniquely set to remove the curse once it was isolated. Nick said clearly uneasy that he even needed to include Dumbledore in this matter. I can understand your dislike of Albus but I assure you that he had the best of intentions. Flitwick said trying to ease some of the animosity Nick had for his long-time colleague. Nick looked the short man in the eyes sternly I am aware of his intentions which is the only reason I have left him mostly alone past the necessary payback for his actions. He said seriously and Flitwick believed him too. The boy had shown that if pushed he was more than willing to attack in extremely efficient and humiliating ways. Mean streak aside he was otherwise fairly easy to approach and tended to joke around most of the time. Enough about that though. Let's talk about replacement for the idiot likely still getting torn apart by the Cornish pixies he released in the class earlier. Nick said smirking as he imagined the horrible treatment Lockhart must be going through. Flitwick blinked in disbelief as if he couldn't believe what he had heard. Could you explain what you mean exactly? He asked and Nick was more than happy to narrate the events of his previous class as well as the way he had left Lockhart. Flitwick shuddered at the thought of the sort of increasingly twisted and terrible things that the pixies may have subjected the man to just because he antagonized Nick. As a master at charms and dueling Flitwick was intimately aware of the fact that including Lockhart behind the shield charm Nick used would have barely been more than a twitch in effort but Nick hadn't wanted to bother. I suppose I can agree to your detention idea until Lockhart gets replaced but this needs to be brought to Albus first to continue this discussion. Flitwick said while sighing as he got up to go save Lockhart. Chapter 228, Don't Touch My Stuff Nick left the office quite pleased with what he had accomplished as he had not only set Lockhart up to get removed early but had also managed to avoid the man before then as well. I doubt the old man won't jump at the chance to get rid of that curse, might need to do some research on werewolves in the meanwhile he thought seriously before making his way to his workshop nearby. Walking in he immediately cursed out loud as he saw his friends messing with his stuff haphazardly. How the bloody hell did you all even get in here since the door was locked? He asked confused. It wasn't some mundane lock either but one made to be unpickable and unlocking charm proof. Helena looked awkwardly to the side while trying to hide behind the furnace. Nick saw this however and sighed in a long-suffering manner shouldn't you all be studying or something to make sure you do well in class. He asked exasperated as he snatched a ring mold from Luna. The first week's just to get us back into the swing of things so we'll be fine, relax. Tracy said eyeing a ring mandrel oddly. I was planning on it but then I found out my long dead relative let my friends into my nice orderly workshop where they proceeded to mess with everything. You probably don't even remember where you got that from do you? Nick asked in frustration. Tracy looked at the mandrel and then looked around before randomly putting it next to the various tongs. That's it. Everyone gets punished. Perversa mundi. He said casting a rather terrible illusion spell that spell twisted one's various senses in such a way to guarantee a headache. Things like tasting with your fingers and hearing with the hairs on your body. 
the best part was that its effects were totally random on each person affected by it and it worked on everyone in a room save the caster themselves. Immediately all of his friends started freaking out at their new and strange senses. While they were dealing with it he reorganized all of his stuff they had misplaced. He had to cancel the spell on Luna however as her nose started to bleed and she was covering her ears. Seeing magic may not affect one all that badly in a magic-filled environment like Hogwarts but hearing it was a totally different ball game. It forced one's brain to make sense of sounds that make none and overloads the brain quite quickly. Nick himself had to deal with a similar problem last year with his own magical senses and was thus aware of the pain it caused. Hadn't expected it to work on magical senses as well, I'll need to keep it in mind next time. He admitted with a shrug as Luna readjusted to her normal senses. I don't like that spell very much. She said bluntly while using a transfigured napkin he had handed to her to clean up the blood on her face from the nosebleed. Nick chuckled it's perfectly harmless most of the time if quite disorienting, perfect to teach people not to touch your stuff, wanna learn? He asked with a wide smile. He had no doubt that Luna would soon have to deal with bullying in her house where he couldn't do anything about it and this spell was great for making a point. Okay. Luna agreed eagerly and Nick began walking her through the steps to cast the spell as well as the wand movements. She practiced for a while all while Nick's other friends were starting to finally adapt to their strange new senses so Nick cancelled the spell on them and watched as they fell into struggling again. A good five minutes later and they had all readjusted and were talking about how bad it was for each of them. Ron had definitely gotten the short straw as he could apparently smell with his feet and hear colors. Considering his poor hygiene and the thick socks he wore inside his shoes and you have an idea of what he smelt that whole time. So I expect that none of you will go messing with my stuff again anytime soon hmm. Nick asked and they all shook their head leaving him satisfied. He then looked at Helena I can't do anything about you but don't make a habit of this or I'll fix that. He warned before passing out cookies to everyone like nothing happened. It became pretty clear to his friends after that that Nick really doesn't like people moving his stuff without permission. Chapter 229, Livid Lockhart Lockhart POV He hadn't been having a very good day at all so far as besides the little chat he had with Harry everything seemed to be going wrong. None of the other professors seemed to appreciate his clear magnificence and even went out of their way to try and ignore him. It was outrageous. Then there was the boy Nicholas Ravenclaw, a minor celebrity in his own right. Yet the boy not only didn't look up to him as he should he actually made a fool of him in front of his adoring students not once but three times in short order. The first was when he so graciously chose to take that immortal bird off of his hands as the clearly most skilled animal handler in the school but had been attacked by the stupid beast. The boy then had the nerve to loudly chide him, Gilderoy Lockhart, on the mistakes he made as if he could ever be surpassed in knowledge by a second-year student. It was preposterous to say the least but he was magnanimous and let them all know that he was merely testing the boy. Then came the second time in which he had his clearly adoring students take a test to see how many truly understood the brilliance of his works only to find out that the boy had snubbed the test as a pointless thing. How could it be pointless when it was written by him, Gilderoy Lockhart? He was a big deal and an expert on the subject of defense against the dark arts and should be revered for his knowledge and yet the boy deemed him unimportant and even had the nerve to tell him what his job was. Not even taking points from his house seemed to bother the boy as he mockingly said it wouldn't happen again and yet not more than five minutes later the boy humiliated him again. This time was the most egregious offense so far as not only did the boy ruin his lesson by using a pathetically weak shield charm that he, Gilderoy Lockhart, could have easily dismantled to stop the pixies from reaching his classmates. But the boy even had the nerve to send his poor adoring fans into the terrible clutches of the pixies after they sought to aid him, even though he didn't need it. If only the true alpha of the band of pixies hadn't stolen his wand when he was about to apprehend them all again. He would have set the boy right in no time at all and yet here he was having needed to go to the infirmary after his precious hair had been brutally defiled by the pixies the boy set upon him. Even worse his perfect complexion had been marred by the pixies using a candle leaving a scar upon his face of all travesties. He shuddered to think of what further injustices he would be suffering if Professor Flitwick hadn't just so happened to be passing by the classroom and noticed the commotion. He had the pixies on the ropes he was sure but alas his efforts were ruined by the charms of his fellow professor. I will be sure to correct that ungrateful child's attitude come the next class I have with him. Lockhart thought smugly but nearly burst a vein the next day when he learned that the boy coincidentally had detention during the exact hours of his class for the foreseeable future. He tried to convince the one giving the detention which was Professor Flitwick in this case to transfer the boy's punishment for whatever he did to himself but he, Gilderoy Lockhart, failed. Missing my class should be punishment enough I suppose. He thought before moving his thoughts onto more important matters such as how to get rid of this atrocious scar upon his divine visage. 
He had begged Madame Pomfrey for a cure but the dreadful woman merely stated that her job was to ensure the proper health and survival of those sent to her and that the scar threatened neither and as such was beyond her job. The sheer nerve to say that a scar upon his face wasn't a threat to his survival. Left no choice at all he approached the sinister personage of Professor Snape to see about procuring an elixir of scar removal which a skilled Pody one or surely had on them at all times. He would have had his own brewed potion but alas he hadn't the time to dedicate his substantial potion brewing talents to make one in recent times, he was very important and busy after all. The terrible man had the nerve to scoff at his request and even smirk at his misfortune however. Chapter 230, Nazfia Mark II Nick meanwhile had cranked on the furnace in his workshop after thoroughly ensuring his message was understood by his friends. Without exception they all chose to leave shortly after he turned on his furnace as the temperature rose to uncomfortable levels for them. Nick was unaffected by this heat though and waited for the furnace to warm up. Once ready he cranked the cold flames in it up and prepared the Nazfia ring he had taken back from Helena to be wiped of its current enchantment and then enchanted again with the new one. He had ensured that the door to his workshop had been locked up securely preventing any energy from leaking out. That was a unique property that he had discovered that the doors and walls of the castle had last year that he used to full effect to keep any hint of his forging method out of the public eye. The enchanting process of the ring was nearly identical to the first time he did so but with a modification. This version of the enchantment also included his newly acquired knowledge and proficiency in veridology. The final result made him smile when he read the appraisal of the system. Ring name. Nazfia Mark II. Grade, Rare. Abilities, Autozizing, Spiritual Solidification, Magic Foci, Bound, Loyal. Description, A ring capable of allowing pure spiritual beings to take corporeal form and allows the use of magic. The power of the wearer cannot increase unlike the living however. System Appraisal, An unusual ring that was made with ghost in mind created by an up-and-coming ringsmith. Nick gave Helena a thumbs up and she eagerly slipped the band over her finger and immediately took on a corporeal form. Nick's eyes widened as he sensed a large amount of magical energy from the air in the castle poured into her as if filling a void it hadn't noticed until now. It's possible that it was only after her form was capable of holding the magic such as now that her magical ability returned. He theorized. The mana as he had taken to calling it over the summer settled in her body at a level between Dumbledore and Mr. Weasley. If he had to say specifically he would say that she had nearly the same level of power as he had felt from Snape if a bit larger. He theorized that this was because she likely had this exact level of power when she was alive. This was by no means a small thing as Snape was one of the most powerful people on the planet despite his relatively young age of 32 years of age. Having been born 984 AD and killed 1000 AD Helena was only 20 when she died. This meant that despite being almost a decade younger than Snape she was minutely more powerful than he was. Whether this was because she had her own talent or because she had full access to and the ability to read all the books in the ancient section was not clear. Nick was very aware of the game-changing knowledge that the ancient section held and as a result was unsure what route Helena took exactly to reach such a level of power. What he did know however from talking to Helena was that she was well on her way to reaching the level of Dumbledore when she was killed. She herself openly stated as much and according to her that level of power was merely a couple of notches below the Godric Greyfinder and Helga Hufflepuff and even more so Salazar Slytherin not to mention her mother who was the most powerful of them all after reaching a new level even though it killed her in the end. Does this mean if he is given enough time Snape may become as powerful as Dumbledore and Voldemort? Nick thought with a shudder. Neither Voldemort nor Dumbledore were perfect at their level of power but a Snape at that level of power was much worse. The only reason the man wasn't cruel and sadistic like most of the other Death Eaters was his love of Harry's mother but if he had the power to bring the world to its knees all bets were off. Good thing he doesn't seem to have any ambition beyond protecting Harry and killing Voldemort he thought in relief. Helena held up her hand and her paintbrush from across the room floated up and into her hand in an impressive display of wandless magic. Nick would have been impressed had it not been for the fact he could sense how inefficient that simple action was for her. Still Helena was pleased and it showed on her wide smile as she looked at the brush in her hand. Now we just need to get you a wand. Lucky for you I happen to know just where to find such a thing. Nick said with a smirk. For the next ten minutes Helena went through the various wands in Nick's possession before finally settling on a cherrywood wand with a unicorn hair as the core. Chapter 231, Buried Alive Nothing really interesting happened for the rest of the week until Saturday except perhaps that Luna had used the perversa mundi on some of the people in her house who thought she was a good target. Flitwick was quite pleased at how she handled them and was not surprised at all to learn from her where she learned such a spell. The professor had long since gotten used to seeing Nick pull out obscure or downright unheard of magics. 
This spell wasn't really one of them as it was in a book on illusions in the library that he himself had read during his school days. That said the subjects of illusions was both very unpopular and very popular at the same time. To be more specific the disillusionment charm which was an illusion spell was very popular but few looked further into the school than that. It would seem Nick shares my view on how underutilized illusions are the small professor thought with a wide smile. The professors weren't supposed to have favorites but in secret majority of them had Nick as a personal favorite, even Severus of all people. Severus Snape may not like people themselves but the man could appreciate gifted individuals, especially when that gift applied to his field of expertise. Still Luna got warned not to use that illusion spell carelessly or with malicious intent which she easily agreed to. Saturday was the day that Nick's group of friends was planning to go visit Hagrid but Harry got a rude awakening from Oliver Wood who wanted to train nearly an hour before Nick even woke up. This meant that Harry was very tired by the time he caught up with the rest of the group and they headed to Hagrid's from the field after the Slytherin team showed up at the pitch. Earlier. As you can see Mr. Malfoy has made quite a generous donation to the Slytherin Quidditch team in the form of an entire set of Nimbus 2001s. You may as well prepare yourselves to lose against us in the future matches. Marcus Flint mocked the Gryffindor team who were still using old broom models. This went back and forth and Malfoy couldn't help himself from trading insults with Harry until Hermione replied with a rather scathing retort and he said something he shouldn't have. You should learn to keep your mouth shut you filthy mood blood. Malfoy cursed at Hermione and everyone in the area froze as an oppressive feeling settled over the area. There was no emotion on Nick's face as he pulled out his wand and gently tapped on the ground at his feet. Immediately the very earth under Malfoy and his group's feet transformed into the giant snarling face of a lion that swallowed them whole. The face then dived into the ground and vanished leaving a hole the size of a fist behind in its place. The oppressive feeling vanished and everyone immediately turned to Nick who stood up leisurely and placed his wand back in its holster. They aren't dead nor dying, merely trapped in a pocket below that hole about 50 feet deep. That should teach them to watch their mouths. He said before walking to Hagrid's hut calmly as if nothing had happened. Blimey Nick hadn't thought you'd react like that, you're usually so calm. Ron said surprised. Everyone else agreed with him as Nick had only ever once seemed so frightening before and that was when Dumbledore pulled his stunt. This time however the pressure Nick released was suffocatingly heavy. Malfoy crossed a line and needed to be reminded that he is not untouchable. I can take being insulted just fine and I can take all of you being insulted as you can stand up for yourselves but there is a limit to what I will tolerate. Nick said sternly. I don't understand what was so bad about what he said. Harry admitted honestly as they reached the hut. Basically it has to do with the purity of one's blood and means dirty blood or less than human in the eyes of those of pure-blooded descent. It's a bunch of hogwash really as bloodline plays next to no role most of the time in magic these days. Nick said with a scoff. As far as he was concerned the entire purest community of wizards are all idiots. Bloodline stopped meaning anything in terms of talent when they stopped excavating their own potential and coasted along for their whole lives. Nick and a few others such as Dumbledore, Grindelwald, Snape, Knoggle, and even Voldemort were different as they all worked hard to fully utilize their talent. It showed too as they were each and every one of them powerful in their own rights. Chapter 232, Improved Opinion Nick wasn't going to say that a lot of his accomplishments weren't because of his bloodline as that would be a lie but he also knew that he worked quite hard to fully utilize what he had. His gift to speak all languages alone had proven to be his second most used ability after his magical sense that was always active. From it he had access to an entire runic language all to himself not to mention his ability to read all the books in the library regardless of language. He had even recently began to branch out his ability by learning how to write the languages as well as tell when he spoke another language. His magical senses on the other hand granted him a deep understanding of the inner workings of magic of all types. Within the last week alone he has dedicated at least an hour every day to practicing his electricity and flame manipulation abilities which was much harder than you'd expect. He had more than a few blisters and burns on his arms under his robes than any of his friends knew. It honestly looked like someone had tried to torture him from how bad it was. He used a healing bomb on them every day after he was done treating Dusk for his own injury much to the bird's discomfort. The problem wasn't getting the elements to manifest for Nick but rather controlling them. Discharging a powerful but uncontrolled attack was easy as well if highly draining on his mana reserves. His issue was the same one he discovered when splitting wand cores over the summer, he had terrible control over his magical output when spell casting. He was like a toddler that only knew how to turn to faucet on in a single direction. Contrary to how it appeared he didn't just get his way in every possible situation as he was simply not making much progress at all. This was the consequences of gaining a lot of power faster than his skill could keep up. 
it was also the reason he had changed his plan about increasing his skill to the same as his magical reserves. Before I even begin to think about doing that I need to slowly improve my energy control lest I accidentally kill someone with a spell he thought after sitting next to the fireplace in Hagrid's hut. He was listening to Hagrid get all angry over the foul thing that Malfoy called Hermione and warned Nick that Lucius Malfoy may make an issue with him over this. I'm not concerned about Malfoy at all since he has taken a serious blow to his finances recently after the black fortune was ripped out of his hands. Offending me is the same as offending Sirius as well and he can't afford it at the moment. Nick said with a smirk. Besides I purposefully left a couple of members of the Slytherin team free to go fetch a teacher to dig the others out of the ground. He added with a shrug. Snape POV. Snape was very unhappy when a few members of his house's Quidditch team interrupted him during the delicate process of brewing one of the lost recipes he had gotten as a gift at Christmas last year meant to clear the mind. The interruption ruined this particular brew as he had added too much powdered dandelion from the sudden distraction. He could certainly save the potion if he could focus on it exclusively but that was unfortunately not possible after the students explained themselves. He was almost impressed at the power of the transfiguration used to bury the other members of his house. But what truly bothered him was the triple meaning behind the exact transfiguration used. First was the giant lion's head that had swallowed them which was clearly a warning from the Greyfinder as a whole. Second was the oppressive feeling that the students spoke of that he was very familiar with. It came from a wizard who was more powerful than oneself as the Dark Lord Voldemort flaunted that ability flagrantly to show his superiority. The final part though was the implied threat of leaving them below the ground with a small breathing hole. Nick had basically just spelled out that he could kill each of them while they were helpless to stop him. It excited Snape to see such a talented individual show signs of being the next archmage like Dumbledore, Grindelwald and Voldemort that had traits from the first two. The boy had shown himself to be slow to anger like Dumbledore but frighteningly vicious like Grindelwald when it suited his needs. All in all Snape's opinion of Nick was elevated a notch as he had all the traits that Snape hoped a powerful figure would have ideally. Chapter 233 Crossed Enchantment Experiment After learning what exactly had gone down Snape deducted points from both Greyfinder and Slytherin as they were both in the wrong but otherwise no one had been punished. Those who had been trapped underground however were now much more fearful of offending Nick's friends and avoided them. Malfoy on the other hand had lost a considerable amount of political pull in his house after news of it spread out. He wasn't a pariah but nobody save his minions Crab and Goyle approached him now. On the flip side Daphne and Tracy both gained a lot of pull in their house since they had been tied to Nick. After visiting Hagrid Nick and his friends hung out in his workshop though without touching anything this time. Most of them were chatting or playing wizard's chess while Nick meanwhile was holding a silver band ring in a vice while he had an engraver in his hand. He was hunched over the vice with a jeweler's monocle over his left eye. What are you even doing over there? Tracy asked curiously but Nick didn't look up when he responded. I'm enchanting this ring with runes to see if I can mix my own unique method of enchanting with the normal one. He said as he finished carving the Futhark word for water. What do you expect to happen if you succeed? Luna asked curiously while brushing Steve in her lap. I don't expect it to succeed at first, in fact I am fairly certain it will actually explode on my first attempt. He said honestly as he loosened the vise and rotated the ring to a side without an engraved word before tightening it again. Is that normal? Daphne is concerned for his safety. It's totally normal, you should see what happens to the bones I try to enchant. Messy business that. He said as he got started carving the Futhark word for cold. Why in Merlin's stinky socks would you try to enchant bones? That sounds like dark arts stuff. Ron exclaimed horrified. Nick scoffed at this though it's not like I needed to rip the things out of something still living to get them. They are just materials like the snake fangs we use in potions or the dragonhide wizards use to make gloves. They aren't dark in and of themselves but rather can be used for dark things just the same as good ones. He enlightened Ron easily enough. Suppose that makes sense but why are you having trouble enchanting them if you can make such awesome stuff already? Ron said confused and all of the others were also curious. Metal is a dead thing and thus has no innate preferences in terms of what sort of enchantment they will accept. Organic materials like skin, bone, and wood however came from living things and thus are the exact opposite in that they very much have preferences. My enchantment method involves infusing the enchantment I choose through the entire material so if the material itself rejects it, bang. Nick explained with a sigh. All of Nick's friends look at their wands in surprise after hearing this as they hadn't realized that the wood also had its own preferences. But how do you figure out what the stuff likes then? Harry asked intrigued to see if his wand would give him a leg up in certain subjects. I have no bloody idea to be honest. 
I've been trying to understand that myself since last year but I've had no luck. Nick said honestly and with more than a little helplessness. What? Tracy exclaimed in shock at this. I'm flattered that you think I learn everything easily but I seriously don't. Nick joked and Luna giggled. The fact of the matter is that I honestly have no references for what I am researching at as a result have no clue where to actually start. To put it simply I am throwing ideas at the problem until one of them eventually sticks, which as you can guess isn't going that great. He said as he finished the rune word and flipped the ring again to write the word ice on it in Futhark. This was also the final word in the set that would create a burst of ice from the ring after activation. Why not ask Flitwick for help then? Luna asked curiously. Nick sighed I did but he is just as helpless as I am since no one has researched this topic as far as history is concerned so I have to start from scratch. His expertise in enchanting makes him invaluable at quickly going through ideas I hadn't thought of however. He explained honestly. Finally he finished the enchantment on the ring and slipping it on his pointer finger he activated the enchantment on the ring sending a burst of ice at the wooden target he borrowed from the old dueling storage room. Chapter 234, Crossed Enchantment Experiment, 2 The target froze as a thin layer of ice formed over its whole body and Nick nodded happy with the effect. Congratulations it didn't explode. Luna said with a smile. Nick chuckled and patted her on the top of the head that's because I haven't enchanted it with my method yet. Speaking of you all need to wait outside for me to finish that. He said motioning for the door and making them all complain about it. Luna thought she could pull a fast one and use puppy dog eyes to get him to let her stay, it failed. Nick simply picked her up and deposited her outside the door with the rest of his friends before shutting and locking the door. As an extra measure he even transfigured a massive stone on this side of the door to weigh it down into an immovable state even if they somehow got the lock open. He wasn't going to risk it against Hermione and her freakishly good memory at things she's seen. Photographic memories may not be an actual thing without legilimency but her memory got uncomfortably close for Nick's taste. After seeing his key he doubted it would be difficult for her to transfigure a forged version. Once he was sure they wouldn't spy on him he took the ice ring off his finger and placed it on the anvil. He then grabbed his hammer that he had seen Luna staring at more than once and went to work. Outside the door the entire group had their ears pressed against the door to see if they could glean any information. This was mostly because just as Nick had expected Hermione had already unlocked the door with a fake key. The girl may act all prim and proper but she could be quite shameless in the pursuit of knowledge. Once it became clear that Nick was wise to their nonsense they had resorted to this current method of spying. Flitwick walked out of his office and froze for a moment when he saw the not small group of people pressing their ears against the door. He quickly figured out what was happening and chuckled however alerting the group who scrabbled in panic. As much as I admire curiosity in my students, perhaps it's for the best if you don't know more about his enchantment method. He teased. But we're just so curious. Can't you tell us anything since you have seen it? Tracy asked pathetically. Flitwick shook his head afraid not as I rather prefer not dying to satisfy your curiosity. He said seriously. I doubt he would kill you over something like this. Harry said reassuringly. Flitwick chuckled perhaps not, but then again he wouldn't need to since I signed a magical contract to never share what I've seen in that room, the penalty of breaking it is my death. He explained seriously. That's so unfair though. Hermione said quite upset to learn about this fact. Flitwick smiled while I can appreciate the empathy but you need to understand that I signed that contract fully aware of the consequences of breaking it and I do not regret my decision at all. He said honestly. Enough about all that though, what's he doing that he didn't want to wait until he was alone to try out? Flitwick asked eagerly. Luna explained what Nick had said he was doing and Flitwick looked excited. Oh my! So long as he succeeds I will certainly place an order personally. The charms professor said while looking at the door hopefully. Nick meanwhile was slowly working his enchantment into the ring as gently as he could in hopes he could succeed. The enchantment was extremely simple so it didn't take him long to infuse but he could only sigh and stop halfway through when a large crack formed on the band. Putting away his hammer he examined the ring to try and see where the problem came from and noted that it was from the runes conflicting with the later enchantment. The clashing energies caused the material to destabilize and crack. Removing the transfigured stone from the door he opened the door with a disappointed expression. He tossed the ring over to Flitwick who deftly caught it and looked it over before easily finding the problem. Not much help I can offer here Nick, enchanting something with two separate systems of enchantment at the same time has never been researched before since there is only the usual way known until now. He said honestly and Nick took out a notebook from Greed and marked it down as a for later project. Nick was helpless in this regard as between researching organic smithing, spell control, 
classes, normal smithing, hanging out with his friends and waiting for Lockhart to royally screw up so he can get fired his hands were full and he had no time for another research project. Chapter 235, Control Training Finally the true schedule for the year was posted in the common room the next morning bright and early. Thanks to having asked the twins however Nick and his friends already knew that it was the same as last year except the times were different. For example Potion's first thing on Monday had been moved to the second period and Charms that was in the second period was moved to the first. This pattern held true until the fourth year in fact at which point the mandatory classes were held later since they were busy with the first three years in the first three periods. In their place was instead whichever electives had been selected at the end of the second year. While most of his classmates would end up choosing specific classes based on which future job they wanted Nick had different plans. He planned to take arithmancy of course but also divination and study of ancient runes. That said he still needed to lighten his workload by the end of the year or risk getting overwhelmed. With that in mind he didn't hang out with his friends on Sunday but joined Helena in the room of requirements where she had been familiarizing herself with magic again since she got her new wand. While ghosts may not lose their memories from when they were alive that didn't mean that if they were around long enough they could lose sense of what certain things were like. It like like how you are aware of what it's like to eat and breathe yet at the same time don't truly grasp it. You do it almost instinctively and forget the sensations with it. Ghosts are like that except they are nearly a hundred times worse off as they can't remind themselves via the associated actions. For powerful wizards like Helena magic was like breathing as she almost didn't even need to think about it. That unfortunately meant that she had lost touch with how to control magic properly after getting a wand nearly a thousand years later. As a result she had been taking advantage of the fact she didn't need to sleep to furiously train that mastery of personal energy back to where it was. Nick was lucky in this regard as it also meant that she was probably the best teacher for him to train his own control. Unfortunately for him however she was a harsh teacher and made liberal use of the stinging hex if he made a mistake. No no, you pulled too much that time, you are only trying to light the candle from here not set the whole thing ablaze. She chastised him after leaving yet another red welt on his side. Taking a sip of Wigan Weld to ease the aches all over his body he tried yet again to channel just enough mana to summon a sting of flame from the wand in his hand to light the candle on the other side of the room. This seems easy at first glance until you realize that the further away the string gets from the body the more mana it required in its entire length at equal strength to maintain. Nick had to not only fuel the magic but also do so in such a manner that he equally distributes an ever-increasing amountage of mana. This sort of training was hellishly hard but just a equally rewarding in terms of control. Despite not having succeeded even once in the last four hours of training his control had improved by leaps and bounds. At the start he could barely get the spell started before getting hit with a stinging hex and yet now he could extend the flame string to half the 20 foot distance needed before his control started to waver. He had also learned an interesting fact about his fire manipulation abilities thanks to this training. They behaved like semi-solid things instead of pure energy like normal fire. Admittedly he only noticed this fact due to growing irritated and trying to explode the candle. At first he thought it was just the air pressure that had caused the stand to also get launched but the spell wasn't strong enough for that. It was only after repeating the spell only stopping it in front of the candle and stand that he definitively saw that the air pressure could barely make the stand move a little. It was only after using the flame itself in a gentle manner that he spotted that the fire was semi-solid. If he focused on it enough he could even grab things with the flames and pick them up, though while still burning them. He could only imagine the terror one would feel getting grabbed by a hand made of fire. Chapter 236, System Evolution Everything was going well after that as over the next week he went to class and made himself look good with his knowledge of the entire year's courses. For example in Flitwick's class they were being taught the dancing feet spell Tarant Legra. It was a simple spell that made the thing or person hit by it move their bottom parts, typically legs, in a random manner that looked like dancing. Nick however modified the spell slightly to cause the afflicted thing to spasm from their entire body like some crazy break dance. Detention was frankly hilarious in Nick's opinion as he was basically Flitwick's assistant during that time that was being used to teach the third years or first years depending on the day. Honestly speaking the classes with the first years were the best in his opinion as they were in awe of his versions of the spells they were learning. Due to Luna being in the class however she was the one who also pointed out to her classmates that Nick was a freak of nature even in his years so they shouldn't try to copy his accomplishments. Nick couldn't argue either as she wasn't wrong about it. Still just knowing that it was possible was enough for the students to work extra hard to master what they were taught during the class. The third year class however was different as they all mostly ignored Nick when he went to try and help them since he had read through their textbooks as well. Flitwick never said anything about it however since there was nothing he could do about pre-made opinions. 
The most important thing however happened at Friday night at exactly midnight and it was in regards to the system. Important Announcement System has finished its adaptation to the host and is now ready to evolve for better utilization. Proceed Y slash N. This caught Nick off guard as he hadn't even known that the system could evolve much less that it was adapting to himself. How long will this take, he thought hoping that the system could read his mind like it normally did when he used it. Approximately 168 hours. The system responded making Nick suck in a breath of air as that was an entire week of time. Fine do it, I just hope this is worth it he thought eventually and he got one final message from the system affirmative, starting evolution. It was an odd sensation for Nick as he could feel a part of his soul that he hadn't been aware of previously heat up for a lack of better words. With its seemingly universe hopping capabilities one would think it would be a huge chunk of it but it was actually tiny instead. Like a hair on his body kinda small. Makes me wonder who made the thing he thought before turning over to try and go back to sleep, he failed since his mind simply wouldn't calm down. When the first rays of the sun began to crest over the edge of the world he could only sigh and get dressed before leaving the dorm. Thanks to his elven physique he didn't need to sleep every day but still did so out of habit so he wasn't tired despite not sleeping much the previous night. Walking out of the common room he casually strolled down the moving staircase and greeted the various paintings he had become acquainted with the previous year. As most of the castle was still asleep it was quite quiet as Nick walked. Soon he left the castle and felt the sun's gentle warmth on his face and smiled before walking out of the courtyard and towards the black lake that was shining in its dark green way. Pulling his broom from greed he transfigured his clothes into a wetsuit and mount the broom and shot into the sky. At this point in time he no longer cared if his flying prowess was exposed to the student population since Madame Hooch and the rest of the staff likely were already aware. The only real hassle might be his housemates that might try and bug him to join the Quidditch team. With that in mind he did a bit of aerial stretching before flying over the black lake and storing the broom in greed again. Without the broom keeping him in the air Nick dropped straight into the center of the lake. The salty water stung at his eyes a bit at first but he quickly got used to it and thanks to his night vision and powerful elvish sight he could still see perfectly. Creating a ring of oxygen around his nose and mouth Nick dived towards the mermaid city below him. Chapter 237 Mermaid City. While the settlement of mermaids was not a secret thing very few wizards actually knew the sheer size of it in truth. Just from the overhead view of it he had Nick could tell it went on in at least two miles in every direction from the trident-wielding statue at its center. Its residents weren't beautiful by any stretch of the imagination with fish tails below their waists and pale bluish skin along their humanoid portions. Each of them had faces much more like fish than humans with massive eyes and protruding faces. Along the sides of their torsos were a set of six slits that opened and closed in unison. Many of these mermaids had heard him splash into the lake but had ignored him until now but were starting to hide as he descended. Mermaids were fairly weak creatures in terms of strength and as a result had been seriously bullied by wizards over the years into the timid species they are now. Halt outsider! A shrill voice spoke up from the side and Nick turned to look at the one who spoke. It was a merman with short green hair and a scar under his right eye wielding a stone spear and sea rope whip. Sea rope is a strange type of woven kelp that was decently strong and cut through water with no issue due to the merfolk's magic woven into it. Nick just smiled at the merman I mean your people no harm. He said calmly once he felt his language ability kick into action. Clearly his fluent speech in the merfolk language caught the merman off guard for a moment. Why do you seek entrance into Azba then? The merman recovered and asked with a now lowered spear. I was rather curious about your people's culture and craftsmanship and figured this would be the fastest way to get your attention. Nick said honestly. With the system unusable Nick didn't want to do anything even remotely related to it and thus figured he would focus on minor curiosities like this instead. The mareman squinted at Nick to look for any sign of deception or trickery but found none as Nick even had his wand holstered. Remain here while I go bring one who may make that decision. The mareman said before swimming down into a specific direction. Well this is going well so far, hopefully I can learn something interesting for these people he thought while doing as instructed and hovered where he was about 10 meters from the surface. It wasn't hard really as he was slightly lighter than the surrounding water and merely needed to breath in or out depending on if he was sinking or not. As he waited he noticed the kraken that had jump scared him the last time he was in the lake approaching. Now that he had night vision and sharper eyesight he could finally make out the entire body of the creature. It was nearly the length of a football field from tip of tentacle to the top of its head and very similar to a squid in appearance. The difference however was that it had nearly 15 tentacles and slightly rounded head but still cone-shaped unlike an octopus. It was rather chilling to see how quietly the behemoth of a cephalopod moved through the water. There was no disturbance at the top of the water nor any current from its movements. 
even when the thing got right next to Nick he couldn't feel it move at all. I admit that's actually a pretty cool ability for a predator to have. Nick said completely relaxed since the thing hadn't snuck up on him. He could have sworn he saw a flash of disappointment in the thing's massive eye but it seemed to be replaced with curiosity. You are probably trying to figure out why I am here right now. Nick said amused at the actions of the massive but gentle creature. It was strange however as the kraken actually seemed to nod at what he said. Can't believe I am actually having a somewhat conversation with a monster that can probably kill me on accident he thought amused before explaining his reason for visiting the lake. A flash of understanding flashed through the giant eye before the creature seemed to bid Nick farewell and swam away. It was nearly right after that that the previous mareman returned with a much older looking mermaid with many beads and strings of shiny stones on her person. I was told of the reason for your visit, what do you have to offer for our knowledge? The elderly mermaid asked without any fear at all. Nick grinned what do you want for it? He asked thrilled about where this may lead. Chapter 238, Origin of the Merfolk The reply seemed to confuse the mermaid so Nick explained himself there isn't actually a lot of information about your people's culture up there so I honestly didn't know what to bring if anything. He said and the mermaid seemed to understand. Typically a scholar would bring something of rarity or value that is not found nearby. She said helpfully and Nick's eyes brightened up and he pulled out a dragon steel ring of protection from greed. This ring can protect from a single fatal attack before breaking. I am the only person in the world who can make it as well. You can ask anyone you like to confirm it too. He said holding ring on his palm that he extended for the mermaid to take. She seemed like she didn't believe him but he had said she could confirm it with anyone she wanted to so she did precisely that. She grabbed a small stone from a string of them on her wrist and crushed it between her fingers. Nick's magical senses picked up a sort of signal being sent out when she did so and was speechless at how easily she dismissed his claims. About five minutes who else except Albus motherfucking Dumbledore showed up in a bubble of air like he was just taking a casual stroll ten meters underwater. The old man merely had a smile and look of just pure amusement on his face when he saw Nick with the merfolk. I had heard you had taken a dip in the lake last year. This is not a casual swim this time I take it. Dumbledore asked casually. Nick shrugged figured the best place to get information on the subject of the merfolk was from themselves. He said honestly. A fine approach if one is familiar with the language, though I hadn't thought you the type to learn such a thing for knowledge. Dumbledore said with an implied question. As you are aware knowledge is quite literally power with my enchantment method and there is so very little known about these people under the waves, it has me rather excited by what I may find. Nick said honestly. If you'd like I don't mind compiling a report on the subject to be added to the Hogwarts library after my personal study here. He added to incentivize the old goat. A glint of intrigue flashed across the old man's eyes before he smiled wider than normal so long as you allow me a personal copy. He said before finally addressing the elderly mermaid in their native language if a little roughly. The elderly mermaid patiently explained the situation and Dumbledore took a moment to mentally translate the words he received. After he was done he vouched for Nick's claims under some sort of oath that all headmasters of Hogwarts had sworn to the merfolk apparently. This seemed to surprise the mermaid who now looked much more favorably at Nick. After that Dumbledore left and Nick was officially welcomed to the mermaid city of Aesba as a foreign scholar. Most of the population was still watching from behind cover when Nick and the two merfolk descended into the city and the elderly mermaid loudly announced Nick and his intentions to her people. While the rest of the merfolk were slowly leaving their hiding spots she also explained that he would need to trade with each individual merfolk for any information they might have that he wanted. I'm definitely going to need to come back with more rings, I only have an extra ten right now he thought calmly. Nick cleverly gifted another ring to the elderly mermaid to learn about her people's history and legends. This proved to be a great idea as he learned something quite intriguing. Apparently according to the elderly mermaid all merfolk were descended from the first merfolk, Oceanus. Nick may not have been able to know who that was as it was said very differently in merfolk than Greek that the name came from. However thanks to being able to translate perfectly he knew exactly which being held that name. The youngest brother of Kronos who was the titan ruler of the rivers and oceans and also one of the only titans who didn't join Kronos in his attack on their father Uranus. This was a huge deal in Nick's opinion as if even the tiniest morsel of that being's vast power or knowledge remained with his supposed descendants a few trinkets would be a steal to pay. He wasn't delusional however as he knew that was very unlikely. Still he was learning so many things from his talk with this one mermaid that he even had to summon a bubble of air to take notes without ruining the paper. Chapter 239, Magical Weaving While most of this information was not particularly useful it was academic gold and would make the report he needed to write much more comprehensive. 
but as he had only asked for the information on the culture and history of the merfolk from the mermaid that was also all that he got. Contrary to what the biased wizarding community thought merfolk were no less clever or intelligent than any human but merely had a more simplistic lifestyle. Nick didn't mind this as he wasn't biased himself after seeing three intelligent species of non-human creatures personally, specifically house elves, manticores, and goblins. After getting nearly three pages of notes on the history of the merfolk Nick moved on to the sea rope weavers to try and learn from them. He was shocked to learn that despite how simple it may seem it was a very complex process. First the seaweed and kelp needed to be specially treated in order to smoothly allow magic to flow into the woven ropes without conflict. Nick eagerly set about learning the exact steps involved as this may solve a bunch of problems he had with organic smithing and maybe even crossed enchantments. It's sad how this treasure has gone unnoticed until now because of the wizarding community's bias he thought with a sigh as he worked to weave a sea rope himself under the head weaver's patient gaze. The merfolk had mastered the art of weaving seaweed and kelp as even Nick had difficulty doing it without taking extra long. If a fold was not tight enough he needed to start all over and if it was too tight the seaweed or kelp would tear forcing him to start over again. He ended up spending all day working on just mastering the weaving step and didn't even get the magical knowledge yet. As the sun started to set he bid farewell to the merfolk and swam up to the surface of the water before taking his broom out of greed and rising into the air while gripping it tightly. Once he was fully out of the water he pulled himself up onto the broom and shot over the lake towards the castle under the stunned gazes of the students still out on the grounds. This allowed him to dry off and when he landed at the entrance of the courtyard he removed the transfiguration on his clothes. Putting away his broom Nick casually walked into the castle in a fairly good mood after having a fruitful outing. Making friends with the fish in the lake. Luna asked from right at the castle's entrance with a teasing smirk. Nat, I did that the last time I went swimming in the lake, this time I made friends with the mermaids in it instead. Nick said honestly and grinned at the wide-eyed look he got from Luna. Are they as pretty as the stories say they are? She asked eagerly. Not really, they aren't hideous exactly but definitely not beautiful either. They take after fish a bit too much for that in my opinion. He answered honestly. Luna looked disappointed at this information but Nick couldn't change reality and the appearances of merfolk weren't exactly secret either. I actually wrote down all of their history that I got today as well if you'd like to give it a read. Nick offered pulling the three sheets of paper with his notes on it. Luna's face brightened up at this and she eagerly snatched the papers out of his hands and began to hungrily devour the information recorded on them. Yep she definitely belongs in Ravenclaw all right he thought with a chuckle. He stood there for the next five minutes as Luna read through his notes carefully and with a look of amazement on her face. Is all of this true? She asked curiously after finishing them. Nick nodded I got it straight from the leader or shaman of the merfolk in the lake so it should be mostly true. The part about them being descended from Oceanus is questionable at best but the rest of it is plenty probable. He said with a smile. Did you know that everyone was looking for you all day but couldn't find you at all? She asked changing the subject spontaneously. Nick wasn't caught off guard as she regularly did such things when they hung out. I don't doubt it since it was a bit of a sudden choice on my part. It's not like it's a big deal though so I'm sure it will be fine. He said dismissively. Luna nodded they didn't seem surprised so you are probably right. Want to walk me to dinner? She asked with a smile. Why it would be my privilege Mrs. Lovegood. He said dramatically making her giggle. Chapter 240, Cruel Lesson they chatted about the merfolk as they walked to the great hall with smiles on their faces the entire way. More than a few people gave him strange looks as they walked past but Nick didn't think anything of it at first. That changed however when his elvish hearing picked up on the conversation of one of those groups. Did you hear about how good on a broom he is apparently? Yet Oliver Wood said he was going to try and get him on the Gryffindor team no way. Nick scoffed at this however as there was no way in hell he was going to play Quidditch. Nick heard several conversations like that as he and Luna made their way to He Great Hall but chose to ignore them. This changed when he heard something else however Corridan. A female voice spoke and his magical senses picked up a spell flying towards them. Fluently pulling out his wand and pointing behind them Nick spoke calmly Protego. Creating a thick shield that blocked the prank spell. Other than that however Nick acted as though nothing happened and kept walking. He recognized the voice as one belonging to Sue Lee of Ravenclaw House though. It was fairly clear to him that she was one of Luna's bullies in that house since the spell was targeting Luna but he simply couldn't be bothered to deal with the girl. There was a few shocked gasps when he blocked the spell without even looking and Luna also seemed surprised but played it off well enough. Su Lee on the other hand was fuming mad after being humiliated so easily that Nick didn't even deem her worth looking at. Densagio. 
she spoke maliciously and the teeth growing hex shot out of her wand at Nick. Nick gave her a chance to walk away after the open prank on Luna but since she chose to stomp on his generosity he was going to teach her a lesson. Turning around he caught the hex with the tip of his wand and flicked it to the side before casting a string of harmless but cruel illusion spells at the girl. Falsus Orum. Perversa Mundi. Chorus Cicadi. Invorto. He spoke rapidly and without stop for all four spells sending a line of back-to-back -back different colored lights at the girl. They all struck her and a look of horror and nausea showed up on her face before she threw up in the ground. This created a chain reaction that made things much worse for her as she completely emptied her stomach while also being terrified to move or act at all. Nick calmly turned back around and continued walking as Su Li's friends tried to help her but only made her scream in pain when they touched her. Luna frowned when she saw this but wisely chose to keep her opinion to herself as Su Li brought this upon herself by attacking Nick. Luna split off from Nick when they got to the Great Hall with her sitting at her house's table while Nick went over to the Greyfinder table to sit next to Harry who was staring at him with a strange expression. Why didn't you ever say you were so good on a broom? He asked both offended and curious at the same time. Nick shrugged I never thought it was important. It's not like I plan to play Quidditch ever so it doesn't affect anyone else but me. He said honestly. Why in Merlin's name wouldn't you play Quidditch if you are so good at flying? Ron exclaimed in disbelief as if offended by the very concept. Simple really, too many restrictions. When I fly I want to be able to do whatever I please whenever I please. The sport might be fun for most people like you or Harry here but for me it would be little more than an irritation to play so I simply won't. Nick explained casually leaving the whole Greyfinder table silent as they couldn't really find any flaws with what he said. Oliver Wood however looked almost heartbroken to hear this as it meant there was pretty much no chance of him getting Nick to play. Shortly after that Sue Lee's friends burst into the Great Hall in a panic and hurriedly spoke to Flitwick at the professor's table. The small man spared Nick a glance before he left the hall but didn't say anything. Almost everyone else in the hall though was looking at Nick warily as the girls weren't quiet at all when explaining the situation to Flitwick. Snape on the other hand a ghost of a smile on his face since he had heard that this had happened because Sue Lee had attacked Nick. Chapter 241, Back to the Merfolk Where have you been this whole time, we looked all over for hours. Hermione asked sternly. At the bottom of the lake conducting research on the merfolk. Nick said simply as he started to pile up his plate with food and eat. Dusk also flew into the Great Hall right at that moment and joined Nick in his feasting. What sort of research? Hermione asked curiously. Merfolk history, customs, and crafting techniques. Even after only a single day down there I have already learned a great deal. You'll have to wait until I publish my report on the matter to learn more though. Nick said with a chuckle. She looked a bit upset at having to wait but there was nothing she could do about it since it was his research to begin with. I'll also be down in the lake tomorrow as well so no need to go looking for me. He added and his friends nodded in understanding. After that dinner went by uneventfully with the slight exception of a very pale and shivering Su Li entering the hall to eat alongside her friends and Flitwick. Besides the fact that she was clearly traumatized she was otherwise unharmed which meant that there wasn't much anyone could say about the method Nick had used on her. Nick went to bed after dinner since he wanted to get an early start on his second trip into the Merfolk City. He awoke an hour before dawn and got dressed and ready to go before leaving the castle and flying out to the area above the city on his broom. A quick transfiguration of his clothes into a diving suit and he stored away the broom and dropped into the lake. It only took a moment for his eyes to adjust to the salty water before clarity returned to him. Creating a bubble around his mouth and nose like last time he descended into the city below. This time none of the merfolk hid away as they recognized him and knew he was not here with bad intentions. Finding the head weaver from yesterday Nick handed over another ring to get back to learning how to make sea rope. It may seem like he was getting ripped off by having to pay twice for the same information but in reality he was more than happy to pay much greater amounts if need be. He finally managed to weave a decent sea rope and get started in learning how to weave his magic into it as the merfolk did. It was honestly eerily similar to the ancient casting method of the ancient wizards but more refined for enchanting than anything. Honestly speaking it was very similar to the Celebrimber method of enchanting except there was no channeling of spirit or need for a hammer. Instead he directly had to actively split his magic into threads that then needed to be woven into the rope via the individual strands of seaweed or kelp. It was very similar to the control training Helena had him do except easier since he just needed to keep the magic threads inside the fibers of the rope. By the end of the fourth hour he succeeded in fully enchanting the sea rope. The head weaver looked it over and flicked out his wrist causing the rope to shoot through the water before wrapping around a crate that he pulled across the ground over to them. It's good, you wove it so it's yours now. 
the mare man said handing the rope to Nick who was surprised. I didn't pay for it though. Nick said worried that something was wrong. The mare man shook his head first rope always goes to the weaver, tradition you see. The mare man explained patiently and Nick understood. It was a sort of rite of passage for merfolk that the first sea rope someone weaves belongs to them. Nick thought it rather funny as Olivander had basically done the same thing with the first wand he had made. If I ever have an apprentice in the future I'll do the same since it's a good tradition he thought with a smile. After that he went looking for the weapons crafters in the city as those stone and coral weapons interested him. It was faint but there was also magic in them that made it so the water didn't slow them down. The process for making these weapons was similar to the sea ropes except with different materials and a slightly different method in the form of honest to God's wandless water magic. The crafters use this magic to create a high pressure intense rotational current of water at the tip of their fingers that they then use to carefully carve the specially treated stones and corals. Chapter 242, Change in Plans To say that he was shocked by this was an understatement as he gapped at the sight. It was only after paying an extra ring that he learned that this was actually a bloodline ability supposedly inherited from Oceanus. Literally every member of the merfolk was capable of it and in fact it was considered a tradition to master the power to the greatest extent each individual was capable. Nick burst into uproarious laughter when he heard this as if the pure-blooded wizards had done the same then they wouldn't be the near worthless wizards they are. Bloodline abilities aren't a joke in the advantage they give a wizard regardless of talent. The biggest example of this is how easy it is for even Luna who had a watered-down version of Nick's magical senses to learn new magic. Being able to literally see what the correct form of a spell was after a demonstration was a massive advantage. Then there was Snape who had what was known as the Hag's Gift which let him easily master any potion recipe he learned as well as improve it. This made him nearly unrivaled in the field with what he may see as little effort. An entire race that mastered their bloodline ability like the merfolk should be nearly unstoppable in Nick's opinion so he wondered why they were so easily suppressed. It was only after watching the craftsmen at work that he figured out a startling thing. Their magical abilities have been partially sealed he thought in horror. He came to this conclusion after watching several of the merfolk activate their bloodline ability and sensing their magical energies. He had felt that each of these adult merfolk had nearly twice the amount of mana as an adult wizard but when they tapped into it a sort of blockage appeared to limit the amount they could actually use. It was so subtle that he almost didn't even notice it until he really started to pay attention. To his senses it felt like something foreign that had been grown around like when a person gets shot and the bullet isn't removed. The difference was that it was clear that it had been there from birth as none of the merfolk seemed to realize it wasn't normal. I don't know what this is but I have a really bad feeling about it. Nick thought with a frown. Unfortunately he knew that he didn't have a chance to figure out whatever it was as it was nearly imperceptible to his senses. Unfortunately he couldn't learn the crafting method of the merfolk since he lacked their bloodline gift and could only spend the rest of the day learning about every facet of their culture. When he was done he had a fairly large stack of paper with no organization at all for the information held within it. Putting the stack away into greed Nick bid farewell to the merfolk and swam out of the city to explore the rest of the lake. This was made easy when a huge horse-like creature with greenish coloration and long kelp-like fins and mane approached him curiously. A kelpie hi? Hey? I knew there was a couple of you in here but you are usually quite shy. He said with a smile as the creature smelled and examined him curiously. Eventually it was satisfied with its examination and pushed its head against his chest seeking affection. Nick was more than happy to rub its neck and scratch it under the chin. Happy at the attention the Kelpie flipped Nick over its neck and onto its back forcing him to hold on tightly as it took off through the water. It was an exhilarating feeling to feel the water flow over the skin and watch as the surroundings zip by. Clearly this Kelpie has done this before he thought as the beast surfaced and swam rapidly in full view of the students outside with Nick on its back. Nick was slightly surprised to see that his friends were at the boathouse with Hagrid who was whistling. It didn't take long for the Kelpie he was on to start making a beeline for the half-giant across the water's surface. Hagrid and all of his friends also saw him on the beast's back and were stunned as the Kelpie slowed down before swimming into the boathouse. Afternoon everyone. Nick said with a grin. I'm so jealous. Tracy exclaimed angrily as Nick slid off the side of the Kelpie and onto the dock. Agreed. Luna, Daphne, and surprisingly Ron said at the same time. Nick laughed it came to me and offered a ride, what was I supposed to say, no. He said with a shrug. Chapter 243 System update complete. Yes. Tracy exclaimed said jealously. Why are you so lucky with magical creatures? First it was Steve and then Dusk and now you are riding on a Kelpie like it's a normal thing to do. Tracy said in frustration. Nick chuckled you probably want to add a Manticore, Unicorn, and Thestrals to that list. 
he said with a grin making her stare at him speechless. You've met a manticore? Was it a boy? Hagrid asked with interest. There is a manticore acting as the guardian of my island but it's female, why? Nick asked curiously. Ah, it's nothing much just that I've been looking for a mate for the female manticore in the Forbidden Forest, Akasha. Still never do have thought you'd have one working for you. Hagrid said honestly impressed. Hold up. You have an island. Ron asked in astonishment. Nick nodded yet it's got my ancestral mansion on it as well as a bunch of rare plants and magical creatures. I didn't think it mattered honestly. He said with shrug. Bloody hell, that's nuts. Ron said enviously. You do realize that Harry's got nearly the same amount of stuff right? Nick asked seriously. What do you mean? Harry asked confused since he couldn't remember owning anything impressive at all save the contents of his vault. You are the last member of the ancient house Potter. A vault full of money is by no means all that falls under your name. The Potters own no less than six potion shops and several ingredient farms not to mention the ancestral home that has been abandoned since your grandparents on your father's side died. Nick explained sternly. Really? Harry exclaimed in astonishment but Nick scoffed. I have no reason to lie to you or keep such an easily findable thing secret. He said slightly offended. Blima Harry you're rich. Ron said excitedly. Sorry to break it to you Ron but literally everyone here other than you is rich, even Hermione. Nick said honestly. Ron looked at Hermione in disbelief but she merely looked away awkwardly. He then looked at Luna but she smiled and shook her head to show she was also included in that. It was only at this point Ron realized all of his friends were loaded and didn't care that he wasn't. Sure he technically already knew this but it had never been directly pointed out until now. After that Ron was a little more appreciative of his friends for the next hour until he forgot about this whole conversation during a heated game of wizard's chess. Nick meanwhile hung out with his friends for the rest of the day in his workshop. The week following that was fairly normal with the regular town sacrifice being pretty much the only exception. Maybe I should take a look at Kronos's book to see if he knows something about what these sacrifices were for. Nick thought after reading that headline about the towns being sacrificed again. Letting his friends know he was going to be busy for the weekend on Friday he waited impatiently for the system to show up again since today was the day. He hadn't crafted any rings in an entire week and was itching to get back to it as he felt like he was wasting time. Celebrimber had told him that he needn't be worried about crafting without the system since he had the knowledge and ability even without it but Nick didn't want to risk it. Instead of crafting he had been mastering his magical control with Helena who was already back to her peak according to her. After mastering the level of control necessary to light the candle with a thread of flame across the room he had to then do the same thing with three threads of fire. This training would only increase in difficulty as time passed and his skill rose since his magical power would never stop growing so long as he was alive. At the moment he had enough mastery of his mana to skillfully use his current full reserves which meant in his eyes that it was time to assimilate the goblet's energy that the Nazgul ring had long since finished extracting. I have already taken care of three of the Horcruxes and only need to get the ring and Harry assuming the slimy bastard doesn't push up the timetable for Najini's addition to the list. The ring I can get over the summer but Harry is much more tricky. If I don't do this just right he might die or worse go mentally retarded. Nick thought as he waited for the system. Like promised the moment midnight struck a familiar sound went off in his head and a message was displayed. System evolution complete. Chapter 244, New Features Name, Nicholas Iron Raven Claw Race, Celestial Elf, Wizard Age 12 Rank 1 Title, Lord Raven Claw, Ringmaker Ring Points 582 Missions, 1 Inventory, Greed Weapon Primordial Wood Wand, Celestial Bird Feather. Armor, None. Accessories, Sanner LL, Greed, Bestia Finus, Iron Ring of Protection 8X. The only real difference from normal he saw at first glance was that he now had something in the mission section and the rank listed under his age. He also noticed that the function of the system had changed a bit as he now had another at his disposal labeled Trade in the Shop section. Looking at the descriptions of each of these new things Nick was both surprised and excited. The mission tab had an explanation of why this function had never seemed to work until now. Apparently the way mission worked originally was by going off of the original future path of events under the assumption that his presence was little different than that of a normal wizard's. Obviously the body he found himself in was beyond extraordinary after drinking the purification potion unlike what the system assumed ruining the future entirely just from the massive inconsistency from the original future his mere presence in the world created. 
add on his actions of changing things to his preference and there was simply no way for the system to give out missions based on its original function. After the evolution however this changed so that now it is missions as based off of him instead of his surroundings. The first few missions were clearly going to be the ones he missed because of him breaking the system's function before it could hand them out. He figured this since the first mission was as follows. Mission conditions established. Description, you have found yourself in the strange and fantastical world of Harry Potter, make some magic. Objectives, enchant a ring, make the ring from scratch, optional, achieve a rare tier, optional. Rewards, 1x item ticket, 500x galleons, optional, 1x crafting method ticket, optional. Status, incomplete. This was obviously meant to be given to him over a year ago but he was only given it now after the evolution when making such a ring was laughably easy for him. The next difference he focused on was the rank under his age. According to the system this was based off the ancient system of power that was used to determine power during the age of the titans and gods after the system scanned the book from Kronos. The first threshold of power or rank was what each wizard regardless of talent reached at the age of 17 when their magic matured. Nick was way ahead of his classmates in this regard as he was at the first rank at 12 from the changes to his soul and absorbing the energy from the horcruxes. Each rank after this was achieved by doubling the amount of mana one had from the peak of the previous rank. For example for Nick to reach the second rank he needed to reach the peak of the first and then double the amount of mana in his body. This only changed at the fourth rank when instead of increasing the amount of mana it was about qualitatively altering it by turning it into liquid instead. That was as far as he could see with his current rank however so he had no clue about what came after that right now. Based on this system Nick could roughly say that Helena and Snape were at the late second or early third rank and Dumbledore, Grindelwald and Voldemort were at the early or late fourth. This perfectly explained why in the Battle of Hogwarts it took three wizards at Snape's level to duel Voldemort to a standstill. After clarifying this Nick turned his attention to the final change which was the trade option. This allowed him to sell the system materials or rings in order to earn points easier since everything really good in the shop was something that took months of saving points to barely be able to afford. This excited Nick greatly as he could start accumulating points easier and affording the good stuff sooner as a result. The only really problem he saw was that the materials he sold were worth far less points than if he was buying them instead. But this was likely done to prevent him from abusing his wealth from his heritage to funnel materials into the system for massive profit. Sure he could still do this to gain some quick and easy points for a specific purchase he wanted but in the long run it was better to actually focus on selling rings instead. Chapter 245, Disturbing Red Nick couldn't sleep after seeing these changes and so got back out of bed and dressed for tomorrow. Quietly leaving the dorm as well as the common word he made his way over to his workshop and unlocked the door before walking inside. Helena looked surprised to see him but he merely removed Kronos's book from greed and she went serious. Are you sure about this? There's no telling what sort of information this thing may contain. She said cautiously. Nick sighed yet I might as well get this over with since I've been avoiding it for quite some time now. He said with a determined expression. POV book. The path to power is a long and arduous one that very few of those blessed by the world can truly travel. My name is Kronos and I write this as a record for a future I have seen that is long after my time when the world is set to begin recovering from the great collapse. May the flow of time favor you ring maker. Before I can speak on that matter I would like to point out how appreciative I am of your caution in reading this work though unnecessary. In truth this tome is by no means the only one I have written and in fact is actually one of the few that I doubted would reach its intended recipient, which is to say you. You see I was born of the, the union of two rank nine beings and thus naturally was attuned to a divine domain, not that you would know what that is yet. In a way you could say that I was like a seer at its absolute most extreme potency. My gaze saw each and every branch of the river of time and all the branches of those branches if I chose to focus on them. It was in this way that I was able to see that my father was bound to destroy this world in most branches of my future and chose to shoulder the weight of villainy to overthrow and slay him. It was the path with the best outcome in the long run. Things were well and good for a few centuries after that until I saw my own apportioned fate. My own children, those known as gods by you would grow cruel and whimsical to the fate of the world and seeing me as a hindrance to their fancy would slay me and many of my brethren. They would then create the human race in their image and rule over this world draining it of mana and resources in the process. This was unfortunately an absolute fixed point in time and inevitable to come to pass. How and when though were all changeable and so once again I chose to bear the weight of villainy and seal them in a barren but mana rich place so they might live but be stopped temporarily from crippling this world. The seal was tied to my own life and so was named Kronos's stomach by my children who would grow to hate me for stopping them. 
A single of my children who would be named Zeus would be spared the stomach by my wife Rhea who would think me unaware of the change. This too was a fixed point in time and so I could only helplessly watch time unfold. Knowing that the world would be magically crippled I began to look past the rule of my children for a time when the world may recover. To my surprise there was a single period of time in which many branches were formed around a single individual and a few of which restored the world early. In each of these branches there was always a single individual at the forefront of the change. I wrote a single tome addressing each and every one of these individuals and scattered them in the precise way that would cause them to land in the correct person's hands but otherwise be destroyed by time. In some branches this caused a good outcome and in others disastrous ones but it was a gamble I felt worth it. With that said I shall now reveal to you the method used to restore the world so that you may prepare for what is to come. You should not try to stop what is to come as you will fail should you make such an attempt as this too is a fixed point in time for your branch. The misguided wizard Grindelwald is sacrificing each of these towns in order to fuel an impressive magical ritual to revert the world to its monodense state that it was before my children ruled it. He will succeed but in the process destroy majority of the non-magical humans' achievements. Chapter 246, Disturbing Red 2. The science of the non-magical simply does not work in mana-abundant places which many of your wizards have noticed. The reason for this I cannot disclose as it pertains to the fundamental workings of reality and you are not ready for such information. However I am writing this to warn you that for the first year after the rituals effect chaos shall grip the world as the non-magicals will struggle to survive and adapt to this new order. Magical flora and fauna shall begin to resurface in vast uncontrollably large quantities while those that had survived till then will undergo rapid primal reversion to their more powerful ancestral states. Magic shall be forced out into the open and while the wizards will try to hide they too shall be exposed to the non-magicals once again. Your role in this, ringmaker, is both simple and complicated at the same time. You much like myself are in the position to guide the world either in a positive or negative direction. Your power and skills will prove instrumental in shaping the world and so you must be warned. Most of my children perished with the world's crippling as they had not the ambient energy needed to sustain themselves. Exactly four of them however predicted their impending doom and sealed themselves away until the world recovered. My eldest child and the kindest of all of them Hestia whom I regret imprisoning the most. My youngest Zeus is the one guaranteed to seek your death regardless of your actions as your innate power encroaches upon his domain. The Forge Master Hephaestus who will ally himself with you against Zeus in most cases. And finally the only god to have survived by sealing away the majority of their power and using a different means of immortality, my oldest son Hades. He alone has silently watched as the eras flowed on and even after regaining his former power will not leave his domain in the underworld. He will sit on the side and watch as your clash with Zeus for hegemony rages on. You will know him by a different name however as he has only ever revealed himself by his domain, death. In the future after either you or Zeus succeed in gaining hegemony he will approach the victor and make an offer. At that time I hope you might accept as a favor to myself. Yours sincerely Kronos. Nick shut the book with a pale face and many different thoughts swimming in his head after the mind-blowing revelations he just obtained. Not only was the truth about Kronos and the gods wrong but four of those gods were still alive today albeit in diminished sealed states. Hades the god of the underworld had even been moving behind the scenes of history this entire time which was a chilling thought. Assuming he hadn't just been sitting on his thumbs during that time but rather had been mastering and learning everything about magic he could it would be no exaggeration to say he was likely the most powerful person to walk the earth. Nick didn't even want to talk about how the underworld was apparently real and that Hades had been there this whole time. The only positive thing he could find out of this whole thing was that three of the four gods coming back weren't going to attack him and one was likely to ally with him. The biggest problem like most Greek myths came in the form of the god of the sky and serial rapist shapeshifter motherfucking Zeus himself. It really can't be overstated the level of fuck Nick was with such a figure definitely going to come for his head in a few years. Why the fuck does every plan of Grindelwald's implicate everyone else? Some of us just want to spend our lives in peace damn it. Nick cursed out loud angrily before grabbing Steve to try and calm down. I need my emotional support Niffler for this bullshit. Nick huffed as he petted Steve's fur to relax. That bad hey. Helena asked slightly worried about how he reacted to reading the book. Nick explained the entire content of the book to her and was no surprised at all to see the look of horror on her face when he was done. I honestly think I got the short end of the stick this time. Fucking Zeus of all people to be coming for my head and I've got to somehow power up to that level within an unknown amount of years after Grindelwald resets the world. Nick grumbled in a poor mood. No wonder the system felt the need to evolve. At my previous rate of improvement I will get crushed like a bug he thought with a tired sigh. Chapter 247, Racial Reveal 
Looks like I'm going to need your help to learn arithmancy early. Nick said slightly irritated. Why would you need that for right now? Helena asked confused. As far as she could tell he should be focusing on increasing his power now that his control was at an acceptable level. I need to modify a few rituals and can't do it without knowing arithmancy. Nick said honestly. She was taken back by this as she quickly went through her memories but couldn't see any ritual that would need modifying. Modify it in which regard specifically? She asked with narrowed eyes. Nick was a little reluctant to say that he wasn't human despite her being unable to share that information. Stealing his resolve he flat out told her that he stopped being human over the summer. I I don't understand. What do you mean you stopped being human, you look and seem human to me? She asked horribly confused. He sighed I am an elf now, no not a house elf or some half breed of it. An actual elf like from the legends, do you remember that strange illness I had last year that had me losing blood and flesh yet was perfectly healthy after diagnosis? That was my physical body transforming into what you see now. He said honestly. Nick then removed the small ring he kept on him to restrain his presence causing Helena's eyes to widen as the true state of his aura washed over her. She went eerily silent for an entire minute before finally speaking again how did you pass the bloodline test at Gringotts then? What about mother's wards? She asked with a hurt expression. You are misunderstanding something here, I am indeed a descendant of your mother even now. Changing my race didn't get rid of what was already there merely elevated it as part of my new form. Nick said and Helena let out a sigh of relief. Then she got mad don't scare me like that. I thought that this entire time you had been lying to me about your heritage. She said angrily punching him in the shoulder making him win C.E. No I am a raven claw but at the same time I am also more than human as you can tell. He said rubbing his shoulder that was definitely going to bruise. So what if you aren't human? Neither was any of the founders. Helena dropped a bomb leaving Nick shell shocked. What do you mean they weren't human? He exclaimed and she giggled at his reaction. When a wizard grows more powerful eventually they start to shed away parts of their human limitations becoming more than human. Each of the founders, mother included had stopped being truly human for quite some time. Even Dumbledore isn't fully human which he is surely aware of. She said casually. Of course none of them totally shed their humanity for a race thought made up by many. You are definitely alone in this regard. She added on with an amused smile at his dumbfounded look. So Slytherin didn't actually care about bloodline purity then? He asked and she shook her head. The truth of that matter had nothing to do with bloodline but rather education. You see at that time most Muggleborns came from commoner households and as such lacked any knowledge in science or even how to read and write. Slytherin thought that it was a waste of time to teach them such fundamental information just so that they could actually learn magic. It certainly didn't help that the witch burnings were quite common at the time. She said honestly. So you don't care that I'm not human? Nick double-checked cautiously. Helena shook her head not at all since unlike house elves, giants, or goblins whatever you are seems to be mostly human in all regards except superior in some way I can't put my finger on. She said with a shrug. That would probably be the spiritual nature of it or maybe it's the immortality. Nick theorized out loud this time making Helena speechless. You're immortal. She exclaimed in shock. He grinned technically ageless but yes. He said cheekily. Are you going to look like this forever then? She asked worried but Nick scoffed. No, I will continue to age until I reach the age of 20 and then I simply won't anymore. I can still be killed though so that's a still a thing. He said honestly. Mother and the others would be so jealous, they all sought a way to have what you do by default. Helena said with a mocking look. The sheer irony of that was not lost on her at all and she couldn't help but feel a bit bad for the founders. Chapter 248, Modifying Rituals Nick shrugged it came with the race, though I did have a choice to stay human but this is just too good to pass up in my opinion. He said seriously. What else can you do thanks to your race? What about children? Will they also be a member of your new race? Helena bombarded Nick with questions and he had to quickly stop her. Besides immortality I only got three changes from when I was human. First is that all of my senses are extremely sharp now. Second is that I am technically able to magically walk without leaving a footprint or sinking into snow. Finally I am very sensitive to spiritual matters now. As for children I am not a hundred percent sure on that one but they should in theory be the same race as me. That's everything important I think. He said and Helena looked like a kid in a candy store. The immortal Ravenclaw clan, I like it. She said with a smile. 
enough about that I really need to modify these rituals for my plans so let's focus on that. He said but Helena shook her head. Just give me a list of the rituals and I'll make the adjustments myself after I figure out what your race's figures are. She said and Nick trusted her not to mess up and did so. She raised an eyebrow when she saw the list but didn't say anything about it as there wasn't anything wrong with his choices. She may have told him to add a ritual for strengthening the soul but his soul was already stronger than any wizard his age by miles so that wasn't necessary. Instead she began to run calculations with a quill and parchment as she looked at him carefully. Nick didn't know much about arithmancy but he could guess that deducing a new race's magical nature with it was a difficult thing. If the rapid numbering and scribbling on the parchment she was writing on was anything to go by he wasn't wrong. Since this was clearly going to take a while he chose to transfigure himself a chair and relaxed while pampering the definitely chunky Niffler in his lap. The poor creature had been getting so many treats from various sources that he was in serious need of a diet as he was starting to get fat. This unfortunately made him seem even cuter so he ended up getting even more treats in what can only be described as a vicious cycle. Nick completely gave up on trying to save the Niffler from the cycle as it was a pointless endeavor. About an hour later Helena finally finished her intense arithmancy deductions and complained about how hard it was. She of course double and triple checked to make sure she didn't miss anything but after verifying that it was all correct began to work on modifying the first ritual. She of course started with the simplest of the lot, the ritual of reflexes. For those who have forgotten this ritual gives one the reflexes of whatever they personally hunted with the more powerful creature to better the result. Nick had long since hunted down an acromantula for this purpose and was keeping the heart and preservative potion until he could conduct the ritual. Unfortunately he needed to wait since before he could conduct the ritual his body had started to transform. Now though he just needed to wait until the ritual was modified to his new race and he could preform it easily. It took much less time for Helena to modify the ritual to his new race since she apparently had done this before she died. It made sense really as during the Founder's time it was a lawless place for magic of all sorts so rituals were regularly performed. She moved on to the next ritual which was the ritual of breath that allowed him to draw in magical energy by breathing. He was especially looking forward to this one as it would solve his issue with each forging attempt draining him of most of his mana. Once that was solved not only would his enchantments grow more powerful but he would also not feel so weak after his was done. Once that was done Helena started on the most complex of the rituals the ritual of nature. This was the ritual that needed to be preformed on Beltane in order to receive a huge boost in magical power. Nick already had one of the ingredients for it in the form of the acromantula fangs and poison glands. He planned on getting the second from the very large and dangerous snake living in the Chamber of Secrets. This was why he hadn't moved on the chamber yet as the ward Slytherin left required Parcel Tongue to open. Chapter 249, Thinking of the Future Despite his gift of tongues allowing him to speak the language he had unfortunately not mastered the ability enough to actively control which language he spoke. Instead the ability automatically translated the language to English in his mind so that he doesn't even notice that it wasn't if he wasn't paying attention to the lip movements of the person speaking. Thankfully he could feel a slight shift in his magic when he himself starts speaking a different language. He was very slowly working on actively speaking other languages but it was hard to control to say the least, like mentally making your heart speed up or slow down. Sure it was possible but it required a level of absolute mental control that was borderline inhuman. Learning to write a new language was much easier in comparison as he could still visibly see the letters despite his ability translating them in his mind. At that point it was merely a matter of memorizing and familiarizing himself with the language's written word and he was good to go. His avian dominion ability was the only one that was untrainable as it was less ability and more a matter of hierarchy. While he waited for Helena to finish modifying the rituals Nick pondered the ring his should make in order to complete his mission from the system. I could make something to stop the basilisk's gaze but honestly speaking it wouldn't be hard to prevent the thing from using that ability at all. I just need to cover its head with a bag or something else simple like that to render it ineffective. I always thought it funny how easy it was to deal with what was its most dangerous feature without any real danger involved. He thought with a chuckle. It was true as well since in order for the ability to come into effect eye contact was necessary in some manner or another. Completely prevent such a thing and the ability is rendered harmless for the most part. Obviously the giant snake wasn't just going to let you put a bag over its head but there was a hundred different methods that could be used to accomplish this. If I wanted to really be cheap with it though I could just get a bunch of roosters and transfigure them into marbles before tossing them into the chamber the moment Riddle tries to open it killing the beast like that. He thought shaking his head. It was rather hilarious how easy it was to deal with a basilisk once you knew you were facing one. Riddle though might be a bit of a problem since unlike his older self he isn't muddle-headed with insanity. 
By this point he had most likely finished attaching himself to Ginny's life force and had taken control of her to a degree. I could just wait until Harry gets the diary in order to snatch it but by that point there is no telling how things would prove themselves different from the books due to my presence. Nick frowned at the thought. He couldn't be blamed either since he was able to admit that this version of Voldemort from before insanity clouded his mind was a tricky and intelligent individual. Such a person was very unlikely to just ignore the threat posed by someone just as talented in close proximity to themselves. While this version of Voldemort was arrogant much like his older self he was by no means arrogant to the point of incautiousness. This was proven when the attacks 50 years ago stopped after Hagrid was framed for them. Rather than continue to terrorize the school and risk getting found out by a Dumbledore who was far less passive than today's version he bid his time. The argument could of course be made that he had accomplished his goal and thus didn't need to continue the attacks but that begs the question, what was his goal? It definitely wasn't to get Hagrid kicked out of school as there were easier ways. It also couldn't have been to get Dumbledore kicked as well because he clearly failed if that was the case. No. The best explanation was that he realized that Dumbledore was on his trail and chose to hide instead. Someone blinded by arrogance would never make such a move so I need to keep an eye out for any attack on myself. Nick thought seriously which also gave him an idea for a defensive ring that he couldn't help but grin at. It was by far the craziest idea he had ever even considered outside the time he had tried to make a world ring and made something that erased a chunk of it instead. Chapter 250, Hundemater It was something none would think he would have on him at all as it was a frankly absurd thing to have. Nick wanted to create a ring that transformed into a massive thunder atronach with the form of a armored warrior. There were a few steps he would first need to complete in order to do so but the final product would be totally worth it in his opinion. The first step of course was that he needed to create his version of an atronach forge. This part he had been planning since he bought the book on the matter over the summer. Unlike the original blueprint for the forge Nick's version was going to be comprised of a set of five connected but not touching rings that when activated would float above the ground and spin around and within each other like a sphere. The outside ring would serve to exclusively fuel the magical processes of the others. The next ring in the set would serve as the stabilizing agent that kept the undoubtedly massive amount of mana within the center of the formation calm and neutral. The last three rings will each take one of the three key processes of the original forge to create Atronax. Together these rings would create a slightly upgraded version of the original Atronach Forge that would allow Nick to create his Hundemater, Thundering Warrior. Before he could make that however he needed to collect the necessary materials to make his Atronach Forge. The list of materials he chose was adamantite, star metal and mithril in large enough quantities to cover the dozen feet long and inch thick rings. The last two materials he could acquire plenty of by using his vast wealth. Star metal however was an extremely rare material that while possible to be purchased commanded a price that even made his deep pockets lighten considerably. There was a solution to this problem however that was very hard to fulfill under most circumstances. He needed to pull down one of the many meteors circling the planet that contained the metal without accidentally destroying a wide area. You would assume a simple momentum removal spell would work but the problem was that the faster something was moving the more mana said spell took from the wizard and meteor strikes are really fast. Nick would barely be able to budge the thing before running out of energy entirely and then watching helplessly as it left a miles long crater in the ground and more likely than not kill him in the process. Left with little choice he could only bite the bullet and dish out a considerable amount of money to get what he needed. While he waited for that though he needed to stockpile points to purchase a small ingot of ebony. He needed the ebony to create the ring that would store away and house his giant atronach so it doesn't cause mass hysteria every time he needs it. To buy a jeweler's ingot of ebony however took a whopping 20,000 points which was a lot by his standard. With spatial magic wasn't so advanced that he was more likely to tear open a black hole than cross dimensions he might have tried to create a portal to the world of Nirn to steal some of the black metal for cheap. That was just the easy part too because if he somehow managed to succeed for whatever reason he then had to deal with the no less than two dozen godly beings there that would definitely take exception to his interdimensional plundering. I think I'll just focus on feeding other rings to the system until I have enough while keeping an eye on Riddle. Nick thought seriously while temporarily shelving the project till later. For now though I can focus on increasing my spell work to at least the seventh year level. He decided as he placed Steve on his opposite shoulder from dusk and standing up. Helena looked at him slightly confused but he merely smiled. Heading to the great hall to eat breakfast, care to join. He said cheekily and she immediately stopped writing. After regaining her physical body Helena had never turned down an offer of food though she had always eaten in secret to prevent news of her having a physical form from spreading. That was no longer necessary as far as Nick was concerned. 
In fact the exact opposite was needed since he wanted to tempt other powerful ghosts into serving him using this information. Unlocking the door to the workshop Nick paused for a moment as he felt a change in his occlumency shield. Carefully checking it he smiled as he found that it had finally solidified meaning he could finally build his second layer of protection. Chapter 251, A New Headline Despite how it seemed it had actually taken several hours for Helena to modify the two ritual from before so it was right at 7 in the morning at the moment. With this in mind Nick figured it would be fine to go eat. There were a few people in the halls who had either chosen to skip breakfast or were heading there themselves. No one seemed to notice that Helena wasn't floating next to Nick but rather walking instead. They also didn't seem to notice how she couldn't be seen through like most ghosts. This changed however when they arrived in the Great Hall and Helena sat down at the Raven Claw table before casually filling a plate and digging in. It only took a few moments for the first student to realize exactly what was wrong with that scene. From there it rapidly spread through the whole hall as almost everybody was staring at Helena feasting. Her table manners were impeccable so she didn't make a mess despite it being clear she was eating nearly as much as Nick. Dumbledore had a serious expression from the professor's table as he had also clearly noticed the wand Helena had. The other professors were also aghast at the spectacle as for all intents and purposes it seemed as though Helena Ravenclaw had been resurrected. Colin Creevy the first year with the muggle camera wasted no time at all snapping a photo of this clearly significant event. Nick ignored all this as he, Dusk and Steve ate though he did notice how Ginny seemed to have an odd look. According to his magical senses however it wasn't her who was making that face but rather the parasitical diary in her robes. Clearly Riddle had never imagined in his wildest dreams that the ghost of Ravenclaw would be resurrected. If the look of dread on Ginny's face was anything to go by then the soul shard had likely already figured out that the secret of his immortality was probably not so secret anymore. The following look of cold determination however tempted Nick sorely to skip out on the basilisk and directly snatch the horcrux from the girl but he stopped himself. He's probably just made up his mind to push the timeline for the first attack forward is all he thought while calming himself. After they were done eating Nick and his two animal companions left the hall without anyone save Dumbledore the wiser. Nick went back to the workshop to hammer out his new layer of occlumency shields while the news spread like wildfire through the castle and even outside of it as students sent owls to their parents and siblings. Nick couldn't care less about this as he sat cross-legged in the workshop with his eyes closed. In his mindscape he was arguing with Celebrimber over the next set of shields he set up. How is that better than my endless swarm of birds? Nick asked irritated as the stubborn elf insisted he use something of his people as a defense. The twin trees of Valinor were the greatest trees of all time to our people and whose final fruits alone became our sun and moon. Nothing could be greater to protect your mind. Celebrimber insisted. They got destroyed though. If I used such a thing as a defensive measure it would expose a fatal flaw into my defenses. Nick shouted to try and drive this fact into the stubborn elf's mind. It would be worth it to constantly bathe in the two trees' light. Celebrimber insisted. If it was the real thing sure but it is just a fake. A fraud. And I refuse. Nick said angrily. They went back and forth like this for hours in the mindscape but nothing got done. Nick had tried to change the stubborn elf's opinion but failed to and as such decided to ignore him. As grateful as he may have been to Celebrimber he wasn't going to create such a blunder in his occlumency shields just to satisfy him. The best he was willing to do was create a replica of the two trees without any real substance to them. So with a bit of a mental flex he spawned into existence two absolutely massive trees within the mindscape. One glowed with a brilliant warm golden light while the other glowed with a pale silver light that felt protective and wise. They were so large that they seemed to blend into the stars above and had trunks and roots the size of countries. Celebrimber smirked when they popped up making it clear that Nick had been played like a fiddle by the old elf from the beginning of the argument. Chapter 252, A Thousand Years Cold Nick merely sighed at this since Celebrimber merely needed to ask if this was all he wanted rather than try and make a big fuss about it. Choosing to ignore the smug-looking elf Nick turned his attention to the outer part of his mindscape just behind his first set of defenses and slowly began to manifest one bird after another. This was an incredibly time-consuming process as he needed to program these birds to fly around the area infinitely with the goal of stopping anything from getting through them. He went so far as to make each and every member of a particular species extremely detailed including nature flight and hunting behaviors. He then created billions of each of these things before having them scatter and join the other species he was creating. In the end he was left with a mini ecosystem of just birds that had the smaller ones getting hunted by the bigger ones. He then set a reproduction mechanism that caused each bird to split into two birds every day. This meant that the longer the second layer was active the more and more dangerous to outsiders it would become. 
With that done Nick finally left his mindscape only to twitch his face a bit as there was three ghosts in his workshop that had not been invited. A obese man in monk robes, Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Porpington and the Bloody Baron. Obviously these were the only ghosts that regularly haunted Hogwarts and each represented a single house each. They were all arguing with each other about who should get the next ring Nick made to give ghosts a corporeal body. Nick knew that while in his mindscape he was disconnected from reality and vulnerable but it seems like he needed to set up a ward against ghosts now. The three ghosts clearly noticed that Nick had opened his eyes but the fat friar and bloody baron ignored him to continue arguing. Nearly headless Nick however immediately dropped out of the argument to speak with him. Nick my boy. Why have you never mentioned that you were working on resurrecting ghosts? He asked with an offended look. Nick chuckled it never came up in conversation besides she hasn't been resurrected but merely placed in a state close to it. Like poltergeist in a way. He explained honestly. Is that so? I won't argue with you on this as you clearly outmatch myself in this department but surely you must understand how one would assume she had been resurrected. The kind ghost said seriously. Nick nodded I am aware of this but fact remains that she has not. But enough about that. What's this whole argument about who is getting the next ring? Last I checked that choice belongs solely in my hands with the exception of you specifically. Nick said pointing at the bloody baron who looked confused. You won't deny me this chance because of what I did before I died are you? The bloody ghost asked with a worried expression. Nick shook his head you didn't hear me apparently, I said that the choice was my except in your case. For you the one you have to convince is not me but her. Nick said pointing at Helena who was painting off to the side. The bloody baron looked mortified by the idea and looked at Nick beggingly but he got a cold glare in return. The ghost looked at Helena conflicted before floating over to her to try and make his case. Revenge is hers after a thousand years it seems. I will not mock him for the irony of the situation but his chances are truly dreadful. The fat friar said with a sigh. Now that that's taken care of back to the matter at hand, I take it Helena has briefed you both on exactly what getting one of these rings from me means. Nick asked seriously and both ghosts nodded with stern expressions. Do know that the rings will stop working and fall off of you should any sort of betrayal towards me happen. That said I will provide both of you a ring soon as I don't have any extras just laying about. Nick said and they both looked disappointed. What I do have is the ring Helena used before her current one that gives her a corporeal body but no magic. You will need to share while I prepare the individual rings but I doubt that will bother either of you all that much. He added and took out the original Nazfia ring from Greed. It was funny to watch the two ghosts haggle out the exact timeline for who gets to wear it and for how long before settling the matter with rock paper scissors. Chapter 253, A Friendly Warning The fat friar got the first shift with the ring much to nearly headless Nick's disappointment. All the ghosts save for Helena were chased out of the workshop after that since Nick wanted to get the rings done as soon as possible. It honestly wouldn't take very long all things considered as he merely needed until a bit before dinner to finish making them. If it wasn't for the fact that the crafting style took a while to slowly fill the entire vessel he could be done much faster. Still Nick turned on the furnace to warm it up and started to prepare the mithril for the fire. First he switched the furnace to cold fire and sent in an ingot of the stuff to melt it in the flames. Once done he funneled the liquid metal into the molds and waited for it to solidify. The remainder was set in an ingot mold to create a smaller but still usable ingot. It took about half an hour for the metal in the ring molds to solidify enough to be enchanted. Removing the first ring from the mold and setting it on the anvil Nick took out his hammer and got to work enchanting the ring. Three hours later he tiredly finished up the first ring and set it aside before eating some lemba's bread and sitting down to meditate in order to restore his energy faster. While he was no longer completely drained of energy from a single intensive forging like this it did cost him nearly three quarters of his total energy. Considering his young age and ever increasing mastery of this method that was actually pretty impressive. Anyone else his age would likely fall out in a terrible condition if they attempted to use even a single word in their enchantment much like he did when he made Atar for Harry. The only reason he was able to create such potent enchantments was because of his abnormally powerful soul and large amounts of mana that both exceed his age by a wide margin. His control training with Helena had also proven useful for forging as he now increased his efficiency in channeling his spirit. This meant he now wasted even less spiritual energy when enchanting things and no longer glowed as intensely when forging. The glow he had was actually the energy he was unable to keep in check and as such dissipated into the atmosphere so with him having better and better efficiency it slowly vanished. Once he reached a certain level of control he will simply stop glowing altogether while he channels his spirit energy. As soon as he fully restored his energy and stamina Nick stood up and removed the second ring from the mold before setting it on the anvil. He then went to work enchanting this ring much like the previous one. 
just like before it took him nearly three hours to complete the enchantment but it was finally done. Taking one of his body enhancement potions out of greed he drank it and felt the warmth of his muscles improving by a small amount in a short period of time. He was still growing thanks to his young age so his current impressive physique was actually just the foundation for his future build. Unlike him though the muscles that Fred and George had from using the potion themselves were mostly superficial. Sure they were stronger than if they hadn't used the potion but they had prioritized appearance over function unlike Nick so while they also had strong physiques it was mostly just for show. The two ghosts waiting outside slightly impatiently were thrilled when Nick walked out of the workshop and tossed them both a ring each while confiscating the original Nazfia ring from nearly headless Nick. After that he headed to the Great Hall to eat dinner but was stopped by Dumbledore in the hallway. I feel as though you should be warned that Cornelius will be arriving at Hogwarts tomorrow alongside a reporter from the Daily Prophet to interview you about your resurrected ghost rings as the students have taken to calling them. The old man said seriously. Nick nodded not surprised at all I expected as much given the man's usual way of doing things. An event such as this is far too important for him to miss after all. That said I appreciate the warning nonetheless. He said politely before continuing his walk to the Great Hall. Dumbledore chose not to look a gift horse in the mouth and silently accept the small amount of improvement in opinion he got for this warning. Changing someone as stubborn as Nick's mind about someone was a slow and arduous process and he knew this and was more than happy to tread that path. Chapter 254, Getting Rid of the Diary Nick got a lot of odd and jealous looks from the other students and a wrathful one from Lockhart at the professor table. Nick ignored all this however and sat down before digging into the food with gusto. After seeing that Nick had no intention of satisfying their curiosity most chose to focus on their friends and food instead. A few more stubborn personalities remained focused on him but he totally ignored them with the exception of Ginny slash Riddle. While no one else seemed to pick it up Nick felt the malicious intent in the soul shard's magic and sighed. I was going to leave you alone for now but since you insist on targeting me I'll get rid of you early he thought without any change in expression. After eating Nick left the great hall and went to his workshop while leaving the door open on purpose. Considering how arrogant Riddle was he doubted that the soul shard would miss the opportunity to catch him alone. He was right too as shortly afterwards Ginny slash Riddle walked into the workshop with a curious expression. Is this where you make all those amazing things? She slash he asked while closing the door. Nick tapped his wand against the floor and ropes immediately sprang out of the stone and bound Ginny slash Riddle while snatching the wand hidden in the right hand away. Don't bother trying to scream the room is soundproof. I was originally going to leave you be but you had to try and press your luck didn't you Tom? Nick asked casually and Ginny slash Riddle's face twisted into a cold scowl. How did you discover me? She slash he asked coldly. Not that it matters all that much but I am rather sensitive to magic and Horcrux magic has an unmissable stench to it that is hard to mistake for anything else. Nick explained calmly while walking over to the bound individual. Reaching into the robes Nick pulled out the worn black leather diary and decisively cut the connection to Ginny it had knocking her out. Taking out the Nazgul ring from Greed Nick immediately disposed of the soul shard before replacing the diary in Ginny's robes and unbinding her. He then disillusioned himself and her before carrying her out of the workshop and to the infirmary. Leaving her on a bed he removed the spell on her and left just as stealthily as he came. Riddle was so arrogant that he had never expected that he would have gotten caught so easily in a trap by a mere second year like Nick no matter how talented. His plan was to try and use the fact that in normal cases Nick wouldn't expect his friend's sister to attack him to sneak attack him. That may have been true if Nick didn't know both who he was possessing and could also sense the diary as easy as breathing. As for why Nick didn't keep the diary it was so Ginny would simply assume that the thing had lost its enchantment as old objects like that tend to. Even if she did remember what Riddle had used her body for and sought him out Nick would simply deny the encounter. If she mentioned those memories and the diary he could mention how that sounded like a cursed object that messed with memories and should be gotten rid of. Nick turned into bed after that so that he was well rested for tomorrow's interview. He woke up at his normal dawn time and got dressed and ready for the day. After that he waited in the workshop for Fudge and the interviewing reporter while also setting up a temporary enchantment locking ward. This will stop any sort of funny business from either of them he thought calmly while sipping some tea he had brewed for this occasion. It was rude to host guests without offering refreshments after all. Clearly Fudge and the interviewer who unsurprisingly turned out to be Rita Skeeter were eager for the interview as they arrived at 7 o'clock exactly. Fudge was all smiles as he walked into the workshop and greeted Nick. Next to him was a blonde woman with glasses and a shifty expression like she couldn't wait to find some flaw to write about. Good morning headmaster, Minister Fudge, Madam Skeeter would any of you like a cup of tea? Nick said in his best impersonation of Dumbledore which made the man himself behind them smirk. 
I think I would quite enjoy a cup thank you. Dumbledore said clearly deciding to play along. Fudge looked completely uncomfortable at the situation but Rita didn't seem to care and accepted the tea. Nick transfigured some chairs and a table for them to sit comfortably. You'll have to forgive me for not having the best accommodations for guests since this room is not usually intended for such an event as this. He said apologetically. Chapter 255, Interview with a Beetle Think nothing of it my boy. We can all understand that a workshop is no place for guests normally. Fudge said speaking up for the other two without their opinions. Dumbledore looked amused at it but Rita had a slight twitch in her face that showed her irritation. Do tell me how the tea is I brewed it myself. Nick said with a smile. It's quite nice if I must say so myself, do you perhaps have any spare leaves I might have? Dumbledore said after trying the tea. Nick shook his head afraid not, these leaves came from my ancestor's personal store that had been under Stasis charm until recently. He said with a smirk. All three of his guests looked stunned at this revelation and looked at the light brown liquid like it was a treasure. Do you mean to say that Rowena Ravenclaw herself drank this tea? Fudge asked to confirm. Nick nodded over a thousand years ago but yes. So while I would like to give some out I have a very limited quantity. He said honestly. But enough about old tea leaves you are here for my most recent achievement no. Nick said with a grin. Rita's face lit up when he said that and took out a clipboard and a quill that dropped to the ground when she released it. What's going on? She asked in surprise at this as her spell right quill shouldn't have any issues at all. Ah. That must be an enchanted quill if I am not mistaken. Nick asked and she nodded. I am sorry to say that due to the way outside spells affect my enchantments no foreign magic functions within this room. I can provide you a normal quill to write with if you'd like. Nick said while making a generous offer. Rita looked suspicious but after seeing how both Dumbledore and Fudge seemed to believe him she could only accept the lack of her favorite quill and accept Nick's offer. Nick merely gave her the quill he was using originally before he got his current phoenix feather one. She had it at the ready in an instant proving she could still write even without her enchanted quill. To start us off with perhaps you could introduce yourself to the readers. Rita said with a smile. My current full name is Nicholas Iron Ravenclaw and I am an orphan as far as I am aware. Nick said calmly. My memory of myself only extends to about a year and two months ago however as I woke up in an alley with terrible injuries and amnesia at that time. I was briefly placed in an orphanage during after that where I started school where I met my friend Harry. He was apparently bullied heavily before I went to the school and stood up to his main bully, his cousin. One thing led to another and soon he was also living in my orphanage with me. It was there that I discovered both my magical ability as well as my gift with metal. Everything after that was pretty much just my time in Hogwarts and my apprenticeship under Garrick Ollivander over the summer. Nick said calmly and couldn't help but chuckle at how little of himself he actually knew beyond his heritage. Rita was furiously scribbling on the clipboard's parchment even after he stopped speaking but that was to be expected from her. Fudge and Dumbledore both looked sympathetic after hearing about his amnesia though. Did you ever try to look for your relatives? Rita asked uncaring about emotional turmoil at all. Nick shook his head no, I believe that if I was truly wanted by some relative they would have long since made some sort of move to find me and yet there is nothing on either the muggle or magical side of things. To me they are strangers and so I will not seek them out. He said calmly. What about after your heritage was revealed and you learned you were a descendant of Rowena Ravenclaw? Surely you must have been curious as to who your parents were or if you were even pure blood to begin with. Rita pressed without mercy. Nick again shook his head I honestly don't care about it since it makes no difference either way. He said honestly and all three of them looked stunned at this answer. Rita looked excited after hearing this however as it was downright scandalous. A rather contentious statement if I must say so, care to elaborate. She asked eagerly. Nick chuckled but shook his head no, we have gotten quite off topic as it is and should return to it since Minister Fudge and Headmaster Dumbledore are very busy people and surely have better things to be doing than listening to my personal beliefs. He said forcefully putting the conversation back on track using the two political hegemons in the room as pressure on Rita. Chapter 256, Interview with a Beetle, 2 Rita noticed this and could only drop the subject to get back on track as while she might be able to get away with offending one of these hegemons slightly both at once was political suicide. Very well then can you tell us how you resurrected the ghosts? She asked with a small amount of bite to show her displeasure at his manipulation. I need to correct this misunderstanding, the ghosts haven't been resurrected at all. All I have done is allowed them to have a corporeal form. So while they appear alive the truth could not be further away. He said with a smile ignoring her displeasure. 
Dumbledore didn't seem surprised at this correction but both Fudge and Rita were stunned. Wouldn't it be easier to fully resurrect them instead? She asked curiously. Nick shook his head to resurrect a ghost nothing short of creating a whole new living body perfectly suited to the spirit would work and even then you would need to somehow anchor the soul to the body correctly which is borderline dark magic like necromancy. All I have done instead was turn water into ice effectively. He explained seriously. How so? She asked while writing on her clipboard. Ghosts while incorporeal have an inclination towards being solid as is shown when they move through fire or smoke and it disturbs them. What I did was pushed this inclination to actually turning solid instead. This let them eat, touch things and actually interact with their surroundings which makes them appear to be alive when they are still just ghosts. Nick explained calmly. How did you accomplish this feat? Rita asked and Nick shook his head that is a proprietary piece of knowledge unfortunately and can't be shared. He said and she frowned but left it alone. Why did you decide to create this ghost solidification enchantment to begin with? Rita asked moving the topic away from the how and over to the why. It is no secret that I spend a lot of time with my deceased relative Helena Ravenclaw or better known as the Grey Lady. As such I was aware of how miserable being a ghost was and most of that misery came from not being able to taste or touch anything. I then paid attention to the state of her existence and carefully put a theory of mine into practice and well the result is obvious. He explained calmly. Rita was writing furiously in her clipboard and he had a suspicion on the sort of bullshit she was writing. Probably some disgusting thing about how he did it due to some sort of romantic connection. He didn't care however as slandering people was her modus operandi and everyone knew it. After Rita kept trying to change the subject to other things such as his magical talents, future plans and other such useless stuff that Nick left purposefully lacking in any flavor or way she could twist that got under her skin. Oh right how silly of me to forget. This handsome fellow on my shoulder is Dusk, a ho-ho that was living in my ancestral home. His favorite thing to do is to burn away any bugs that happen to find their way in here. His favorite is of course beetles, I've seen him slowly burn away their legs and then the rest of their bodies. Thankfully they were just normal bugs since I doubt I could stop him if it was something like an animagi instead. Nick said while looking at Rita especially who was sweating and had a fearful look on her face. Fudge didn't seem to understand how that was important information but Dumbledore was far from stupid and quickly figured out what was going on. So that's how she gets her information, it would appear she has chosen the wrong target for slander this time the old goat thought with a small smile as he watched Nick basically threaten the reporter. Rita herself was also not stupid and had figured out that Nick was aware of her illegal animagus status and was not so subtly telling her to not try and twist his words or straight up lie about him in her article. She could only grit her teeth and accept this as she drew a line through all the false stuff she had written down. She wanted to obliviate him so that her secret was safe but all the information she had gathered about Nick said that she would have a better chance fighting off a group of Death Eaters instead. Not only was she aware that he had on eight protective rings that automatically activated but also that his reactions to being attacked or wronged in some way are extremely cruel. Chapter 257, Parcel Tongue Ring the interview ended shortly afterwards as Rita wanted nothing more than to stay far away from Nick at that point. Nick of course played the role of host flawlessly and saw them out of the workshop and down the hall politely. Once they were gone he immediately took down the magical restriction ward in the workshop. Contrary to how it may seem he was very much affected by the thing as it shut his magical senses inside his body leaving him uncomfortably blind to his surroundings. He then locked the door to the workshop and cranked on the furnace as he had an idea how to open the chamber himself since he had destroyed the horcrux. So his idea was to create a ring that forced his magical ability to allow him to speak parcel tongue on purpose. Sure it would only be useful when he need to speak that particular language but that was fine since he could just sell the ring to the system after he was done with it. Switching the flame to dragon flame after it warmed up Nick grabbed a small ingot of silver and tossed it into the furnace. Once workable he took it out of the fire and placed it on the anvil before taking out his hammer and a round tip punch to open a hole in the middle. He was gentle when he struck the end of the punch so as to not mess up the metal as he slowly created a divot in the center of the metal bar. Flipping it he repeated this process on the opposite side in the same location. He had to stop in order to reheat the metal but after that he got the hole through the middle. Placing the bar on its side he then slowly started to open the hole wider without stressing the metal. He did this by gently rounding the inside edge of the hole on both sides. Once the hole was wide enough he placed a ring mandrel in it before rounding the outside of the bar into a band shape. He needed to reheat it a couple times during this process but he made it in the end with the ring being a thick silver band with rough edges and no design. From there however he carefully took a thin file to the band to carve out the shape of a coiled serpent into the band. 
This included individual scales the head and the body taper with the coils looking to rest beside the next. He even included the belly scales and underside as he did so which created a rough outline for him to follow. Since this filing had to be done cold and very precisely it took him two hours to get a semi-lifelike silver snake ring finished. It was very large for a ring but Nick knew it would change size with his auto-sizing feature. All that was left was to polish it and enchant it for it to be done. Nick stored away the semi-finished ring before heading to the Great Hall for lunch since it was close to that time. The meal went by uneventfully and so he went back to working on the ring with the polishing and finally the enchantment. This time he used four words while hammering the enchantment into it, Lok, Snake, Lamb, Tongue, K, Speak, and T-U-R, Power. These words alongside his intent and the knowledge he used as the base of the enchantment created the following ring. Ring name, K Lok. Grade, Rare. Abilities, Autosizing, Parcel Tongue Speech. Description, A ring that forces its wearer to speak in the language of snakes. System Appraisal, An strange ring created by an up-and-coming ring smith. Nick took off one of his protective rings and slipped on this ring which shrunk down considerably to fit on his finger snugly. Then he spoke testing of the ring's ability immediately he felt the subtle change in his magical ability that told him he had succeeded in making a ring that allowed him to easily open the Chamber of Secrets. Taking the ring off and storing it into greed since he didn't feel like speaking only snake tongue all the time he called it a day for work. He still had another hour or two before dinner time so he headed to the room of requirements to set up the ritual of reflexes. It was honestly not going to take very long at all to complete since there was no real requirements besides the ingredients. He still needed to create the ritual circle but otherwise he was totally prepared already. The ritual circle had the runes written in a specific pattern within it and once set up Nick took out the Acromantula heart and started the ritual. Chapter 258, Attack and Rage The ritual circle lit up and Nick felt the changes take place in his body as the Acromantula heart slowly turned to ash. It was a strange tingling at first before turning into a intense burning as all of his nerves grew more perfect and connected increasing his perception of the world drastically. He passed out directly when the changes to his brain began to accommodate this sudden increase in reaction time. He woke up when the changes stopped five minutes later and immediately felt the difference. It was a bit like moving in slow motion as he perceived the world around him but his body couldn't move at the same speed he was perceiving it. The disconnect wasn't huge but definitely noticeable like each of his actions were just a moment after his thoughts. This is going to take me a while to get used to he thought as he left the room which reset it entirely erasing any trace of his ritual. Once out of the sealed environment of the room of requirements Nick felt the biggest difference from before the ritual. He could literally feel the air currents around him despite how subtle they are and it bothered him greatly. So this must be what spiders feel all the time, no wonder they can react so fast he thought as he felt the gentle air flow around him moving in a manner not unlike that of flowing water. Or at the very least that's what it felt like to him at the moment. Thanks to the improved connection between his neurons Nick also thought faster than before son he had these thoughts within mere moments rather than a few seconds. It was thanks to this that when his ears heard the sound of rustling robes and he felt the airflow change he was beginning to move to take out his wand and block the attack. Obliviate. A certain male voice spoke but even when the malicious intention spell came from the assailant's wand Nick was already dropping down and, and turning to dodge it as well as get into position to counter. The green spell flew past Nick's right side harmlessly and he pointed his wand at a well-dressed man with a rapidly morphing facial expression from glee to horror. Petrificus totalis. Nick spoke angrily and the petrification charm shot out of the tip of his wand in a blinding fashion as he overcharged it in his rage. While he was protected from the effect of the obliviate charm thanks to his occlumency and sanner it didn't change the fact that Lockhart had just tried to erase his memories. Why the man was even on the seventh floor at all was totally irrelevant at this point and it was only Celebrimber's voice in his head stopping him from blasting the bastard into literal pieces. It would be oh so easy just to use a blasting curse or even an overpowered splitting charm to reduce the man to a red smear on the walls. Nick didn't do that however but rather paralyzed the man and waved his wand to strip the wand out of his hand. Walking over to Lockhart he directly kicked the man's legs out from under him before tapping the ground causing a stone horse to come out of it with the man draped across its back. All the professors and Nick's friends knew something was wrong as the weather rapidly shifted from sunny to near hurricane in no time at all. Nick was absolutely livid and his magical ability was running out of control instinctively. Everyone felt an intense pressure weighing down on them before the sound of horse hooves showed up. The first professor to track down the source of the disturbance was Dumbledore thanks to his own sensitivity to magic and connection to the castle wards. He had a stern expression as he recognized the look in Nick's eyes all too well as one of near-mind-consuming wrath. 
he had had that same look the day that his heritage was revealed to the world and it suddenly made sense why the weather had turned so violent. It was magic similar to that of a Thunderbird's but far more potent due to not having any finesse at all behind it but pure emotion and not a good one. Nick saw Dumbledore and pressed his wand against his forehead before flicking the memory of the event at the old man and leaving as Dumbledore let it sink into his head. He left Lockhart behind to be dealt with by Dumbledore as he still had enough reason left to know he needed to leave before he caved in and killed the man. Chapter 259, A Stormy Day Dumbledore POV I watched the memory that I had been given with more than a little irritation as I already had an idea of what happened. It wasn't hard to figure out to be honest if one paid attention to details. Gilderoy Lockhart was a showman with an overinflated ego that wanted nothing more than to be the center of attention. Any skill he may have had when he left Hogwarts originally was clearly gone at this point which was confusing if his merited work was to be believed. The truth however quickly became clear in this memory. The man had simply foregone all other magics in exchange for a single one that he clearly used often. Obliviate, a nasty spell that I wish wasn't necessary to keep the wizarding world secret that erases memories. It took me a mere moment after seeing the skill behind the spell used by the man to piece together the pieces of the puzzle and I don't like the conclusion I came to. Lockhart had likely taken other wizard and witches credit for these accomplishments while erasing their knowledge of them even having done it themselves. The memory was so tinted by rage after that that I had to activate my own acclumency abilities to keep it from infecting me as well. I was impressed by Nick's self-control in the face of such raw violent emotions even if the rather hard kick to Lockhart's legs to knock him over showed he felt the need to hurt the man. Once I returned to reality from the memory I could only look at the paralyzed man on the stone transfigured horse with a frown. Taking out my wand I pressed it forward expecto patromum. I said and a spectral phoenix flew out of the tip before rapidly vanishing down the hallway in search of Severus. I dismissed the transfiguration which sank into the floor restoring the total mass of the castle. I then conjured ropes to bind Lockhart before removing Nick's petrification of the man before applying my own. Perhaps Nick hadn't realized it but his anger at the time of casting the petrification charm had corrupted it slightly to slowly cause Lockhart to suffocate. Had it been lifted any later and it may have caused actual damage to the man's brain. A few moments later Severus came around the corner at a fast walk carrying a vial of golden potion with a deep glare. There's an empty classroom nearby, we can use that to administer the Verita serum. I say softly and he merely nods quiet even for him. I couldn't blame him however as this matter was very serious and could have wide-reaching consequences. It wasn't as simple as Lockhart merely attacking a normal student but had several other factors that could inflate this case greatly. For example how the student he attacked was the heir to House Ravenclaw. Or the fact that he may have obliviated any number of wizards illegally. Azkaban was a guaranteed outcome for the man but the exact sentence depended on exactly what this truth serum would reveal. My biggest concern however was the storm raging outside the castle that I could hear howling and rumbling in constant reminder of the very short fused student that needed time to calm down. After Lockhart was strapped to a chair in the empty room I woke him up with the energizing spell re -Enervate. I spoke and his eyes shot open immediately and he looked confused for a moment before opening his mouth, likely to spew some nonsense about being attacked. Severus however immediately shoved the now open vial of Verita serum into the man's mouth causing him to choke and sputter for a moment as the potion seeped down his throat. Name. Severus spoke sternly once the telltale glazed eyes showed up on the man. Gilderoy Lockhart the drugged man said in a monotone. Severus looked at me and nodded to show that the potion was working as intended. While it was normally illegal to use Verita serum on an unwilling person that law had a clause that stated that so long as it was administered by a ministry approved individual it was still admissible. Severus as one of the few Grandmaster Pody winners was automatically counted as a ministry approved person. Did you attack Nicholas Ravenclaw with malicious intent? I asked familiar with court-approved interrogation etiquette. Yes. The man said blandly. Why? I pressed. I intended to take his accomplishments for myself since he didn't deserve them. The man spoke and Severus visibly grit his teeth and I myself also felt more than a little anger at this answer. How did you plan to take these accomplishments? I asked holding down my temper but both Severus and I needed to step out of the room after hearing the answer lest we act on our anger. Chapter 260, A Stormy Day, 2 Nick meanwhile was already in the castle's courtyard letting the rain and wind wash over him as he raised his wand high above his head and simply let his rage and magic flow through it. A dense bright beam of lightning flew from the tip of the wand into the clouds above harmlessly but Nick felt better after venting out his anger at the sky. Oh he was still livid but at least now he was wasn't likely to do anything stupid in his anger. He ignored the terrible weather however and walked the castle grounds as the weight of his wet robes clung to him. 
the wind pushed against him and his hair fluttered every which way but he was otherwise unaffected by it. Nick found a log near the lake that he sat down on and stared off at the sky above while slowly calming himself. The weather also slowly receded and changed from a terrible storm to mere rain as he did so. The students inside the castle also relaxed as this happened and began to speculate as to what caused the storm to begin with. Most simply chose to believe that it was a freak storm that had happened a few times in history. Nick's friends however were searching all over the castle for him but couldn't find him in any of the usual places. Not the workshop or library and not in the courtyard of the castle where he liked to hang out to read. They checked the great hall but he wasn't there either and so they were all at a loss. Luna was especially insistent on them finding him and kept looking at the sky outside the windows with a worried expression. It was ironically through such an act that they spotted his dark figure sitting at the lake's edge on a sun-bleached log. It was raining however so they were hesitant to go running out into it and getting soaked through. Luna had no such concern and immediately left the castle in a dash towards where he was. Harry was the next to do so and the rest followed shortly afterwards. Nick had a blank look as he stared at the sky above while the rain fell on his face. He noticed his friends approaching him from behind but didn't react to their presence. His mind was calm but empty as he focused entirely on the sky above, it may as well have been a sort of meditation that instead of focusing inside focused on the outside instead. It was frankly terrifying to Luna as despite being able to see his magic since he wasn't restricting it she still couldn't read him at all. It was like looking at a natural fixture in the magic of the surroundings and blended in with the world itself. She knew immediately that it was wrong, people weren't meant to be blank and without intent or emotion. At the very least that was what her experience told her as even babies had emotions and intents if a bit out of control. If a Buddhist were to know of this however they would feel privileged as one in such a state of emptiness was a holy and enlightened state of mind. Luna neither knew of this nor cared as she immediately hugged Nick from behind snapping his mind out of that state. He was calm however and merely looked at his friends before tapping the log he was on turning it into a long bench. You all right mate? Ron asked worried. Yeah. I just needed a moment to calm down after Lockhart attacked me. Nick said honestly. He did what? Nearly all of them exclaimed at the same time. He attempted to obliviate me but failed and I imagine is currently getting interrogated by Dumbledore. Azkaban is the best place he can go because anything less and he won't be breathing soon. Nick said coldly with more than a little murderous intent that made Luna shiver on his back. He retracted his magic under his skin at that point as he had honestly not realized she was there till now. It was like waking up after being asleep with someone holding you, you simply wouldn't register that information until a change happened like you or the other person moving or making noise. You can let me go now you know. He suggested but the pale silver eyes that looked up at him from over his shoulder said that she didn't believe him. He could only sigh and leave her be after the scare he likely gave them all with his not so little explosion of anger. Focusing his wand at the sky above he channeled his magic into the clouds and willed them to disperse. 